Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee. Annie Danis Rodriguez, the chairman of this committee. Before we proceed, I would like to remind you all of the Car Free Day on Saturday, a great initiative in partnership with our Mayor de Blasio, DOT Commissioner, uh, Polly Trumber, and everyone that are our partners. So on April 21st, we will be opening Broadway to pedestrians and cyclists from Fortune Street to, to 47th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue from 181st to 190th Street in Washington Heights. We officially announced the programming yesterday with Commissioner Tromberg at Times Square. On Monday, April 16, at 8 30 a.m., the University Transportation Research Center at City College will hold an academic panel on going car free at the New, at New York City, at the New York Institutes of Technology. For this hearing, I am joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Matthew Diaz, Ku, Menchaca, and Power. Today we will examine traffic congestion in New, York, in New York City, and in particular, the Mayor's Congestion Action Plan. There is no doubt that congestion has gotten dramatically worse in our city in recent years. Traffic speed in Midtown have dropped 27% since 2010, and things are not much better outside Midtown. We know there are many causes from increased del deliveries, especially with the rise of electronic commerce, to increase construction, population and economic growth, a struggling subway system, and of course, the rise of app base for higher vehicles such as Uber and Lyft. And we also know that the effect of these increased congestions are far-reaching and dire. Bus ridership is falling, particularly in Manhattan, where we see some of the worst congestions. Businesses and consumers pay the cost when goods cannot get delivered on time, and our air quality suffers when more and more vehicles are stuck in, tra stuck in traffic. There are, of course, many proposed solutions to the congestion problem, most prominently congestion pricing. This committee has been continuously examining all the issues related to traffic congestion, including at a comprehensive and informative hearing last, last June. Today, we will focus in particular on how management of our corp space affects traffic congestion. The administration has begun implementing a congestion action plan with five components, clear lanes, clear curbs, clear intersections, clear zones, and clear highways. The most conse consequential aspect of these changes is the removal of parking and loading zones along certain streets in Midtown. Brooklyn and Queens, with new no standing regulations intended to create an additional travel lane and keep traffic moving. This, of course, has implications for businesses in these areas in terms of the impact on both customers and deliverers. Although an important element of addressing congestion is encouraging of hours deliverers, something DOT has been working on and I also support. There are also types of types of deliverers and other business activity that simply has to get done during the day. Today we are interested in finding out more about how the balance between getting traffic moving and the need of residents and businesses is being achieved in the context of these new policies. We need to understand how the success of these programs will be measured, what metrics will be used, and how they will be evaluated. And we need to hear a commitment from the administration regarding transparency and communication. Residents and businesses in the affected communities need to have a seat at the table. The traffic congestion problem in our city is complicated and needs in some ways as a consequences of our city 
vibrant economic, and lack of urban planning for many decades. There is not going to be one magic solution. The Mayor's Congestion Action Plan is one approach to one element of the problem. We need to work together to ensure that it is effective while limiting any negative impact on residents, businesses, activity, and communities. After all, our local businesses have just as much interest in addressing congestions as everyone else, as it affects them directly too. So we all need to work together on solutions that as much as possible work for everyone. Today, we are also hearing proposed intro 210-A, sponsored by Council Member Matthew, which will give property owners more time to make repairs when they receive sidewalk violations from DOT. While maintaining the sidewalk is an important responsibility of being a homeowner in New York City, it is also a costly and time-consuming responsibility. Giving homeowners more time to comply with orders from DOT to repair their sidewalks is a common sense change that will benefit New Yorkers throughout the city. I now invite Council Member Matthew to deliver an opening statement on this legislation. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. I'm here speaking uh, about introduction 210A, uh, which will double the amount of time that property owners have to fix their sidewalks after receiving a violation. Currently, if a property is cited for damaged sidewalks, a lien will be placed on the property and the owner has 45 days to complete repairs. Even under the best of circumstances, 45 days is not always a sufficient amount of time to seek out quotes from contractors, compare prices, and get work scheduled and completed on time. During some parts of the year, that is outright impossible because the cold weather prevents any work of this kind from being done for months. If a property owner receives a violation in the late fall during the winter, then they have little choice but to wait until repair work becomes feasible and end up getting stuck with the lien in the interim. This is not fair to property owners who in good faith actually want to fix their sidewalks on their own. This is especially true when you consider that it's much more cost effective than waiting for DOT to come to do the work. That is why I believe that 90 days is a reasonable amount of time to give home, homeowners to fix the cracks and breaks on their sidewalks before we slap a lien on their home. Uh, I welcome the administration comments on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will focus first on the, for the first few minutes on allowing the council members to ask questions on this legislation so that then we'll uh, just focus for the rest of the time on the uh, mayor congestion plan. So it is your time to, or oh, you want me? Okay, you will. Okay, then. Okay. So I would like to, I want to welcome Commissioner Polly Tromber on representation of the administration who is here today with her team. Thank you for being here. I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite you to deliver you, uh, your statement. Good morning. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Polly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation. With me today are Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zak, and Senior Project Manager for Transportation Planning and Management, Kessia DeLeo. I'm also joined by my colleagues from NYPD's Transportation Bureau, Inspector Dennis Fulton and Inspector Scott Hanover. Thank you for inviting us here today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio to testify on the Mayor's Congestion Action Plan. Separately, I will also speak on an unrelated bill before the committee today, Intro 210A. As you said, Mr. Chairman, facing greater congestion than ever before, New York City is a victim of its own success. With its thriving economy, a record 8.6 million residents, and 62 million tourists last year, the city is experiencing a period of remarkable growth that strains our transportation system daily. At the same time, the booming economy has fueled a surge in construction, resulting in travel lane closures to both put up new buildings and upgrade aging underground infrastructure. The rapid growth of the for hire vehicle industry has also contributed to congestion, particularly in the Manhattan core. In just two years, from 2015 to 2017, TLC data show that active for hire vehicle trips have quadrupled to over 400,000 per day, 
growth that is both extraordinary and arguably unsustainable. And from 2010 to 2016, vehicle registrations in New York City rose from 1.7 million to 1.9 million. New registrations outpaced the rate of population growth in every part of the city except Manhattan. When I sat before you at a council hearing on congestion nearly a year ago, I gave an overview of all the city was doing to combat congestion, with a focus on creating alternatives to driving. And today I'll simply re reiterate that our commitment remains just as strong in the mayor's second term, from working with the MTA to speed up bus service, to creating more bike lanes, to promoting shared mobility options like bike share and car share. We expect dramatic changes in the year ahead that you've heard about at other hearings, including the L-Train tunnel shutdown, we have solutions on the table, and of course, EDC will introduce their fifth and sixth new ferry routes this summer, from Soundview in the Bronx to the Upper East Side and down to Wall Street, and from Long Island City to 34th Street down to the Lower East Side and also ending at Wall Street. And as we all know, the governor and state elected officials have begun addressing congestion by enacting a four higher vehicle fee in the recent state budget. But as the governor has said, it's only the first step. The city plans to work in partnership with the state and the MTA and our delegation up in the state legislature as the debate on congestion pricing continues. But in the meantime, the city is moving forward with the tools at our disposal. As the mayor said when he announced the city's congestion action plan back in October 2017, congestion affects quality of life, economic efficiency, and our environment. And it impacts both New Yorkers in personal and for hire vehicles and those who ride buses with 2.5 million trips each day as well. And as you all remember, and as the chairman just reiterated, the mayor's plan included five key points, clear intersections, clear curbs, clear lanes, clear zones, and clear highways. And I will speak about them in greater detail. Since the mayor announced his plan, City Hall staff, DOT, NYPD, and other city partners together have been actively meeting with elected officials and stakeholders to answer questions and invite feedback. We hosted a City Hall open house session, 12 separate meetings with a dozen of industry groups and individual businesses who both make and receive deliveries and held briefings for elected officials and community stakeholders in each borough. And those meetings are ongoing. I'll now go through the plan in order of implementation, but I want to stress that we are literally in the first days and weeks of many of the plan's elements, so it's too early to draw firm conclusions. I'll start with clear intersections. On March 5th, NYPD Chief of Transportation Thomas Chan and I stood together at Broom Street and Broadway in Lower Manhattan to announce that we had completed don't block the box street marking and signage at 50 locations in all five boroughs. The NYPD is increasing enforcement at these locations to keep traffic moving, and the NYPD will ultimately have 50 offers dedicated to this enforcement. Second element, clear curbs, is a six month pilot in three highly congested areas where we're restricting parking and loading on both sides of the street during the weekday peak hours of seven to 10 a.m. and four to seven p.m while allowing expeditious passenger pickup and drop off. New, clear, new clear curb regulations, which you can see illustrated behind me, went into effect on Flatbush Avenue from Grand Army Plaza to Tillery Street on March 19th, on Roosevelt Avenue from Broadway to 90th Street on March 20th, and in a zone from 6th Ave to Madison Avenue and from 45th to 50th Streets on a rolling basis beginning on March 31st and completed on April 6th. Before the signs went up in each clear curbs pilot area, we sent our street ambassadors to visit local businesses throughout these zones and distribute informational materials about the pilot. To enforce these regulations, NYPD has assigned additional officers to these areas. NYPD is also observing a five-day grace period between the time the new regulations are posted and when they start issuing violations. As the pilot has been gearing up, DOT team members, myself included, have been on the ground in all of these locations to share information and answer questions and we continue to stand ready to work with local businesses and stakeholders. We also invite stakeholders to visit our website, nyc.gov slash mcp, or call, us on our, or call our borough commissioner's offices to share their feedback with us. We will continue to seek feedback throughout the six month clear curbs pilot, and I encourage all of you to reach out to me or my NYPD counterparts at any time with your questions or concerns. DOT and NYPD will be closely monitoring the impact of this pilot with on-site observations, traffic cameras, regular travel speed measurements, assessments of curbside activity, and specific feedback from stakeholders, including an online survey of businesses. Third element of the plan, clear lanes. In addition to the three clear curb zones I just discussed, we've added an additional layer of treatments in Midtown, clear lanes, where our congestion problems are the most severe. As we install the clear curb regulations, clear lanes regulations also went into effect on 11 key crosstown streets from 36th Street up to 60th Street. 
DOT has streamlined and extended regulations on one side of the street to create a continuous curbside travel lane from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. while permitting deliveries on the opposite curb. These regulations already exist on some length of these corridors and from 7 p.m. on, these lanes revert to metered parking. We're extending them further west and working with NYPD to enforce them in a revival and expansion of the 15-year-old through streets program. The regulations in Midtown are complex and I want to explain that where existing regulations are more restrictive than the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., those have remained in place and in regulations where metered parking begins at 6 p.m., which actually turns out to be quite a few places, we're keeping those regulations. Part of the complexity we're dealing with in Midtown in particular is the many competing uses. Intense commercial activity, diplomatic parking, press parking, ambulance waiting areas, the theater district, and the diamond district, just to name a few. To help enforce clear lanes, NYPD has doubled the Midtown Manhattan Traffic Enforcement Task Force from 40 to 80 traffic enforcement agents and is in the process of deploying 110 patrol officers to focus on moving and parking violations, double parking, and off-route trucks in this area. Through our off-hour deliveries program, DOT offers technical assistance on an ongoing basis to businesses that opt to shift deliveries to less busy times. We offer how-to guides, assistance with curb access where needed, and recognition for program participation, and we hope as many businesses as possible will take advantage of it. And in a move we hope will be popular with cab drivers, we've lifted restrictions on turns at 29 midtown intersections that we thought were actually contributing to congestion. We're installing new turn lanes at these locations where feasible and studying them for signal timing changes. Fourth element of the plan is clear zones. DOT is examining solutions for particular areas outside the Manhattan core that face severe congestion working with other city and state agencies and local elected officials and stakeholders. Key areas include downtown Flushing, North Shore of Staten Island, Hunts Point, and downtown Jamaica. Final element of the plan is clear highways, and we've begun engaging with our partners at New York State DOT to address congestion on the major highways they control. We'll work with state and local elected officials to bring everyone to the table. We're starting with areas that New York City commuters know well, the Staten Island, Gowanus, and Cross Bronx expressways. As we proceed with each part of this five-point plan, we'll be continuing to learn, see how the clear curb pilot and other parts of the plan are going, and take feedback. All told, we expect the elements of this plan to cost $5 million annually on average, but we're still working through many aspects of the cost estimations with OMB. NYPD will also have personnel costs. We know some of the things we're doing in this plan represent big changes on the street. We recognize that they pose challenges and stand ready to problem solve as we continue to implement this important mayoral priority. I now want to turn to intro 210A, also before the committee today, which deals with the minimum amount of time provided to property owners to correct adjacent sidewalk violations. While DOT plans to repair up to 2 million square feet of sidewalk per year, this amounts to less than 1% of the city's total sidewalk. With 12,750 miles of sidewalks, which if lined up end to end would stretch more than halfway around the world, the city must rely on property owners to do their part in maintaining the rest, as they're required to do under the charter and the administrative code. All New Yorkers should be able to travel safely and comfortably on sidewalks throughout our city, including those using wheelchairs, mobility aids, and strollers, or simply pushing a shopping cart. If every property owner does his or her part, we can make a safer, more accessible city for everyone. So owners should address defects before a complaint results in a violation. However, once owners have received a violation, they are responsible for making prompt repairs. Section 19-152 of the Administrative Code establishes a minimum amount of time for the adjacent property owner to correct a sidewalk violation before the city may initiate repairs at the owner's expense. Intro 210A seeks to amend this from 45 days to 90 days from the date they receive the violation. I want to explain that once a violation is issued, within a day or two, a non-monetary lien is placed on the property until that violation is corrected. But there is no monetary penalty. The 45-day period is the time after which the city can perform repairs at the owner's expense if it chooses and bill the owner. Those property owners who do wish to correct a violation on their own can do so. About a third of repairs are done by property owners, in many cases because they wish to sell the property. In these cases, the average time from violation to repair is three and a half years. If the city does the repairs, there is no additional penalty, just the requirement to pay the repair bill. And at an average, give or take, of $18, per square, $18 per square foot, New Yorkers might be surprised to learn that city completed work may be less expensive than hiring their own contractor. DOT's sidewalk repair program is active in each borough and usually covers about nine community boards per construction season. 
which typically runs from mid-March to mid-December. Therefore, with 59 community boards citywide, once we finish addressing as many sidewalk defects in an area as possible, it may take our Sidewalks and Inspection Management Division, SIM, up to five years before it returns to that community board. So ideally, the statute would strike a balance between allowing minimum sufficient time for adjacent property owners to make their own prompt repairs where they wish to, without creating an undue delay on DOT's ability to correct substandard sidewalks and charge responsible property owners. To give an example, in the next nine community boards for which SIM plans work, 7,282 properties have active violations for us to repair at this snapshot in time. Of these, 177, or just 2.4%, have not reached the expiration of the currently required 45-day period. Violations are continually reaching the 45-day mark, and other new violations are always being added. But at any given moment, a small but appreciable number of violations will be less than 45 days from receipt of a notice of violation. What this means for these cases is even though we may be right there in the community board doing work, we're not able to include those properties, which for the reasons I explained can mean up to five years before we're able to return to the area again and perform the repair. And any increase to the required period would incrementally increase the number of such cases. Therefore, the change in the amended version of this bill to make this period 90 days is well compa compared to the 120 originally proposed. We look forward to working with Council Member Matteo on the final legislation should the Council move forward. And we thank the committee for the opportunity to offer our views on this bill. We also want to thank you for inviting us here to testify on the Mayor's effort to help ease congestion and improve quality of life. My NYPD colleagues and I will now be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a, a question, and of course, this is something that working together with Councilmember Mario, we definitely would like for you to continue in the administration uh, with a plan to, you know, move forward on his bill. How many notice of violation for sidewalk defect the DOT issue to homeowners in 2017 and 16? Hang on, I've got that number. Hang on, we will dig it up for you. Okay. Whoops. Twenty seventeen, fourteen thousand four hundred and ninety-five citywide. Fourteen thousand. Can you repeat? About fourteen thousand four hundred ninety-five. And sixteen. 12,739. So we sort of increase then. Right, and remember, mo most of our violations are complaint driven. They're, they're, they come from 311. Mm -hmm. So wh wh why do you think that the increase happened from 17 to 16? I'm not, I, I'm, I'm lucky here actually I have Leon Hayward who runs our sidewalk management program. Maybe he has an answer to that question. <laughs> so, um, so we so the name is Leon Hayward. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalk and Inspection Management. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that happened from 16 to 17 is that we increased our resources in the sidewalk area. Uh, we hired more inspector, inspectors and we were able to go out and have more inspections in the street and issue more notice of violations. So we had more resources to address the 311 complaints that came in that allowed us to issue more violations. What type of violation does your inspector are looking at when they go and do an inspection? Primarily trip hazards. So they're looking for sidewalks that are cracked, broken, lifted. Those are the type of things that we're looking for to prevent uh, pedestrians from tripping on the sidewalk. Okay. Now I pass it to Councilman Matthew who ask other questions. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Um, Commissioner, and, and just, just buttressing the, the point that Chair Rodriguez made about um, the complaints. The complaints obviously are, are driven mainly through 311. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways you may get them local. Uh, we, we get them from elected officials, elected officials and community the boards, letters, and right. sometimes okay. just citizens will reach out to various of us. But so. Um, you know, I'm concerned about the number going up because, you know, and I, we spoke this about this a few times. Um, DOT will, will go out if they get a complaint and they'll look at 15 Victory Boulevard. But you'll look at the whole street. Why is that? Instead of 
why are you going to the, the adjacent property owners when there was no complaint? I mean, in a, you know, in a large city like this one, the thing we are constantly striving to do with our sidewalk program is make the most efficient use of both the inspectors and the folks who go and do the repairs. And so when they come on a street for one complaint, while the inspector is there, we think it is a logical, efficient use of their time to investigate the whole block. Because you know, one of the challenges we have, particularly in our sidewalk program, as I mentioned, we have over 12,000 miles of sidewalks. Just sending them here and there to answer only one complaint at a time is not the most efficient use. I mean, as, as I said in my testimony, our goal here is to keep our sidewalks safe and accessible particularly for people who are wheelchair users, and particularly also to avoid something which is a liability for the city and for homeowners, which is obviously when people trip and injure themselves on damaged sidewalks. Um, thank you. So, so listen, I, I, I understand. I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. Um, I think we're unfairly going after a whole block that, that didn't have complaints. But with that said, um, my concern is if you, it's December 1st and you're, DOT just went down the entire block and issued violations and then issued uh, a, a, a violation that says you have 45, to, 45 days to repair it um, or the city's going to do it themselves. Um, one, I, 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 in my, I've been in government for, since 2004. My, my um, experience is that DOT is not repairing them right away. And two, you can't repair sidewalks in the winter under 50 degrees, uh, the sidewalk can't be set. Um, private contractors have told, told, told us that. Um, so we're, we're telling them to repair it in 45 days, um, but we're, we're in reality, that can't happen. So why wouldn't we want to give them, uh, especially that, that homeowner who wants to repair it themselves? And, maybe, and I know you said that it's, it's $18 per square foot on average. Um, you know, I have, I have estimates from Staten Island contractors who will do it for 10 to 12 or 14 to 17 based on the driveway slab. So why wouldn't we want to give them more time to, to repair it themselves? It's, it, it's really a balancing act. The, the challenge is for us, for better or for worse, most homeowners don't repair their sidewalks in a timely way. As I said, the average is only about a third of them do it and the average time it takes is three and a half years. So just again, getting at that efficiency challenge for us, since we are cycling through all 59 community boards, we're only gonna get to a given neighborhood about once every five years. And it's just the, long, the, the larger an inventory of properties that are still in this, be it a 45 day period or whatever the period is, we skip them. And then potentially many years go by before those sidewalks get fixed if neither the homeowner does it or the city doesn't do it. And so again, unrepaired sidewalks are trip hazards. So I, look, I think it's, it's not, obviously it's, it's, it's a sort of a compromise solution um, and we'll certainly work with you on it, but just that, that, that's the creative tension for us, you know, to the extent that those properties haven't hit that 45 day mark, we skip them and they just may not be repaired for many years, which is a pity because we're right in the neighborhood. So do you, do you have, or can you get us some of numbers that you know, if, if Victory Boulevard was hit and you think that they get in that contract, is, is that really happening? Is that is that happened in the past that we've actually got, got them in the next contract? And the second part of that question is, when are you letting out sidewalk contracts? I mean, we, we as we said, our construction season for the contracts is sort of mid-March to mid-December. So, so just at the time period when the homeowner can't fix the sidewalk, we won't be fixing it either. Nobody is pouring concrete when the weather is cold. So they're not gonna lose they're not losing any time in the winter, so to speak. And you know, we do talk to the homeowners. If they are keen to make the repair themselves, we are happy to try and work with them. It's just for efficiency's sake. I hate to skip properties when I'm in the neighborhood. I'm not gonna be back for five years if then that property also isn't gonna be fixed promptly by the homeowner. Okay, and listen, I, I, it's, I understand that and we're trying to strike that right balance to, to give that homeowner that time. I mean. I, 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 my office gets a lot of complaints, as your borough commissioner will, will know about a lot of DOT issues, but they do complain when they're getting a lien on their property um, when they want, and especially senior citizens. Senior citizens are the ones who are calling my office saying, we want to we want to repair it. We don't want the city to do it. We have someone to do it. I can't do it now. Why are they going to put a lien? And in your testimony, I believe you said that a lien now is put on after two days. 
Right, the, the lien is, is filed right away. So it, it is unrelated, just you know, something, and look, the, the city sidewalk program is, is quite complicated. I'm the first to admit it. So the lien doesn't happen after the 45 days or if you made this 90 days after the 90 and, days. And so why not? Why wouldn't the 45-day that, that, grace period? The, that's the admin code. I mean, if we- It's in the admin know, code? Yeah, like, if, if we'd like to work with you all to make changes to the program, that's obviously always your prerogative. But again, the lien is not a monetary lien. Oh, I understand. And there's no, you know, there's no penalty. There's no financial penalty for anyone. I understand. It's still, it, it gives my constituents consternation when they're, when they're trying to do the right thing um, and trying to repair it themselves. Um, on, on, the viol on the violation itself, does it say that a lien is going to be placed on the property? Or it, it just says? Oh, yeah. It, it, it says it. We, I have a copy of the letter right here. Um, it says it pretty clearly. But it also explains how you can contact our office, how you can appeal the inspection, et cetera. So you know, we, we give people the opportunity to communicate with us and work with us. And you know, if you have a lot of constituents who are really ready to do the work and then we went ahead and did it, obviously let's talk about that. If we have homeowners that are really anxious to do the work quickly, we, you know, we're happy well, to work with them. In all fairness to Tom Coca-Cola, who does a great job, we, we talk about sidewalk relations with him all the time and we do the reinspections, and we understand what's what's the result of of a city tree that the homeowner is not responsible. So we walk our constituents through it. We bring them in because we've been dealing with sidewalk violations for uh, since my predecessor was was the council member Jimmy Otto. So um, listen, I, I still with all that, I still think there's a fair balance that we can uh, come to an agreement with that give the property owners a little bit more time to uh, repair their sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, and we will continue working with you on this legislation. I would also now, would like now to acknowledge Council Member Cabrera, Reynoso, Van Bremer. I uh, have now a few questions related to the major congestion price uh, plan, uh, and then my colleagues also has questions. As I said before, I do believe that we need to create the cultural and the program in our city to see most of the delivery happening at night. But I believe that as the city, city hall being in conversation, especially with the truck association and the food distributors and many other stakeholders in that area on how to switch to get more delivery during the night time, it, I just hoped uh, to see more uh, 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 more focus being on building that partnership than anything else. And with that, one of my questions is, what I heard after meeting with many of those stakeholders who are the ones doing the delivery is that it took them by surprise when the plan was announced. And what it was shocked to them was that they were holding meeting with DCAS, and DOT and the whole coalition for years trying to come out with a plan. Of course, I also understand that sometimes we need to put a plan of action. But what I hear from them is they were surprised that they were not engaged in the process to discuss this plan. So can you share with us, you know, what was that experience and what do you think it still can do better to bring them back to this conversation and to be, for them to be part of evaluating the whole we, I mean, we certainly, and I'm, I'm looking over obviously a lot of the, the representatives of the various industries, <coughs> excuse me, who we have had a chance to meet with on several occasions, as well as we've held meetings with elected officials here at City Hall, in the boroughs, and we have gone to door and done our best. I understand, look, this was obviously a, a mayoral priority, and I know the industry wishes we had had more time for dialogue ahead of time, you know, always an area we can do better, and we certainly hope going forward that we will have close lines of communication. I will reiterate again, this is a pilot, so we really want to be on the ground helping to troubleshoot with their particular issues. I think you're right that we have been talking to the industry for a long time about doing more to shift deliveries to the overnight. And I think we've discovered there are a lot of challenges to it. I mean, a lot of things we need to work through. The city at one time had a program that actually was funded federally to provide incentives, businesses to do that. We don't have those federal funds anymore. And businesses have to work through the issues of 
for the receiving stores and restaurants and buildings? Will there be someone there to receive the goods, or can they have what some facilities have now, which is basically they trust the shipper, they give the shipper a key, and the shipper can come in and bring the goods. In some residential areas, people don't always want the deliveries at night, but we totally agree that we need to certainly do more of that. You know, another area that we're seeing, for example, for, you know, as you've seen the growth of Amazon and all these delivery companies, we've seen now, for example, local drugstores are taking a room and making it a delivery room and a truck can come and bring you know, 500 packages to one location and then residents can go and get those packages at their leisure instead of having the truck drive all around the neighborhood for hours on end. So I think there are some creative logistical solutions that can come and I think we're hoping that this pilot look for better or for worse and I know, you know certainly our industry partners are acclimatizing to it as are we, but I am hoping it will help us spur you know, some new creative thinking you know, on how we can shift more deliveries to, to off-hour periods. Can you share with us some of those, even, and I understand what you said, that most of it that was funded by federal funding and we don't have those funding anymore, but, you know, in many initiatives, they stay in the city, we have understand that with the new administration, we have to be creative. We need can also to identify some funding that are important uh, for uh, areas uh, in our city. What were those incentives that uh, were funded under those federal funding? I mean, businesses that participated, they, for, they got a lot of technical assistance, some of which we can still offer, which is helping them think through the dynamics and the log logistics of their delivery systems and potentially for a larger chain, for example, like a CVS or, or you know, something that has many different facilities how you could you know, rejigger their delivery times en masse. But stores were eligible to receive, not, not a huge amount of money, but something of a stipend to help defray the cost, for example, if they wanted to keep someone on for extra hours, either very early in the day or later into the evening to accept those shipments. And, and to the NYPD, what has been the experience in the last few days that you, well, since you have already seen officers enforcing how is things going the last few days, especially in those areas? What we found is that, first, let me just say that uh, we did perform some outreach ourselves. We visited the businesses in, on Roosevelt, on Flatbush, and also in Midtown. Our transportation outreach unit also had a sound van, and in English and Spanish, they wrote up and announced the, uh, some of the uh, changes that would be happening. Uh, the experience we had so far has been positive. Um, you know, we saw that uh, traffic was moving a little bit better on Roosevelt. So to answer your question, it's been relatively positive, but it's only been a week, so. And it was, uh, it was uh, really not indicative of like the usual week because school was out last week. And I think our enforcement began, began on March 28th. And so in the coming weeks, we'll learn more. We introduced a language it, which I have in, reintroduced, calling for the city to put together a plan that working with the private, with the private, uh, with the industry, we should aim to say in 20 years, this is how much we would like to switch, you know, to change the labor from day to night. I just believe that incentives are critical, and I just believe that there is some member of the industry that they provide their service and deliver things related to health, medicines, things related to uh, the Diamond District, those areas. Like, what is the approach that we have in this plan to particular area where the Libre will not be allowed, for truck not be allowed to park during, in the morning and even in hours? All right, I'll, I'll answer that, and I think MP NYPD will want to answer as well. Whoops, sorry, I'm getting some feedback here. I mean, look, we recognize, and obviously we've been talking to the industry, oil deliveries, Diamond District, a lot of pretty unique challenges, particularly in the Midtown area. And I think our goal here is to try and see how we can integrate this pilot project while also working through, obviously, some of the very real and complicated street uses. And I think NYPD has been granted the discretion they need to handle these situations in a, in a useful fashion. Yeah, we're not, <coughs> our first choice is not uh, to issue a summons. Our if the person's around the vehicle, if, uh, you know, we want the initiative to work. 
Uh, so we, we have discretion, each officer, if there's a need, if there's an emergency, of course, our officers are saying we want to work with the community. We want to move traffic safely. So what, when a traffic agent uh, is assigned, their main responsibility is to issue summonses, but they don't do it haphazardly. They will come to the car, they'll look, then if there's a person in the vehicle, their first option is to let the person know to move the vehicle. That's not to say we won't issue summonses, we, we will be. And that's, we're trying to get this to work, but that's when someone, there are all people that are inconsiderate that will, will park their car there and, and, you know, as a deterrent, we will issue the summons. But our first choice, we still have the discretion. If there is someone in the vehicle, we'll ask them to move. And I think the general indication, like you, we, we had brought up before, has been positive. People want to improve traffic conditions, and so they've been, so far, it's only been a week, but uh, it's been positive. You, Sorry. Can you please describe the outreach to a stakeholders that, that City Hall, under your responsibility, has conducted during the development and planning of the congestion action plan with the industry, where local businesses, delivery companies, residents, elected officials, and community boards consorted, and in which way were you able to get their feedback? Right, so just sort of to review the timetable, the mayor announced this initiative um, uh, in November, and just I'm looking at sort of different industry stakeholder groups. We conducted meetings uh, we, with, starting in early November, going through um, the most recent meeting we did at the end of last month with Deputy Mayor Anglin, and looking over at many of the people we met with, heating oil industry, New York City Partnership convened a meeting with a whole group of industry leaders. We've met with the big shipping companies, FedEx, UPS, the Trucking Association, CNS Wholesale Grocers, Empire Commercial Services, Logistic Exchange, Cisco and the New York State Restaurant Association. We conducted a, a big meeting in our offices with Fresh Direct, Verizon, FedEx, Connective Strategies, New York Heating Oil, Walgreens, Con Ed, Cisco, Coca-Cola, and the Trucking Association. We also met with the beer distributors, and then industry came in here to City Hall to meet with Deputy Mayor Laura Anglin and, and some of her team. On the elected official side, and some of you may remember this, because pretty soon after the mayor made his announcement, we had a session here at City Hall, invited all elected officials to attend. We then did individual elected briefings in Queens, particularly focusing on Roosevelt and Brooklyn, focusing on Flatbush and in Manhattan, focusing on the Midtown area. We did presentations to local community boards and then have followed up with some calls and meetings since then. And then on the DOT side, we've sent our street ambassadors out to go door to door and do flyering. Flatbush the second week in March, Roosevelt the second week in March, Midtown end of March. And then I know PD, I expect our Fulton can jump like in. A, PD like side. I said, our tra transportation outreach team visited all the businesses up and down. So they were out a full day. Uh, they went to uh, different days in March. Before they talk, they went actually went into the stores. They talked to the uh, business owners on Roosevelt one day, Flatbush the next, and then in Midtown they walked up the uh, the streets that have been designated as Clear Lane streets, and they did all the uh, uh, businesses, and then they basically uh, handed out the flyer to every business that was open at the time when they were uh, when they were in the neighborhood. And you know, for disclosure, you know, I've been there. I was there when the mayor and the commission and they, you know, make the announcement. I guess like after being in the announcement meeting with some of the members of the industry, I do believe that they also have made important points when it comes to listening to the concern, listening to the feedback, and I think bringing back, coming back to the table as for years, conversation been going on between their, uh, the industry, DOT, DCAS, and other members of City Hall to talk about how the focus should be more on creating the incentive, even though I do also believe and recognize that everyone had to do their part. Congestion is real in our city. We had to address it. But I think that this announcement like, took them by surprise, and, and I hope, again, that you will re-engage in conversation with them. We, we certainly will, and look, we, we know obviously it was a mayoral priority and, and a fast implementation. We, we didn't want to catch anyone by surprise. We, we did our best to do thorough outreach. Obviously, we did not reach everybody as much as we would have wished to, 
But again, we will continue during this pilot period to have that engagement to try and problem solve. And I would just say on the incentive question, Mr. Chairman, I think you know traditionally the city has not paid private businesses incentives in a situation like this. We did have the federal grant, but obviously something we could explore with the council. Thank you, Commissioner. is standard to me is can what the city as the largest receiver of deliveries is doing to take nighttime deliveries well i think you're going to actually have some of your indus the industry folks here to testify on this and and look i think different you know different major parts of the industry are looking to stagger hours, but, you know, we, we certainly talk to the major shipping companies, to Coca-Cola, to Anheuser-Busch, to a lot of the places, to, to Fresh Direct, to a lot of the places that deliver door-to-door. -door. And, you know, I don't think we've sort of gotten wholesale ability to transition to nighttime delivery hours. That's going to take more work with the industry. I, I think that the question is focused on how the city also make the changes to be sure as a receiver that also you're working with those private sector who deliver to a schools, to hospital, like have the city doing their part. Oh, yes. Is the city taking the deliveries at night? Well, it's a good question, actually, and one I think industry has fairly put to us. And, you know, city buildings run the gamut just like they do in the private sector. Buildings owned by the city with their own sets of uses and, and you know, personnel and union restrictions. And then we, for example, DOT, we're in a private building that has it, uh, its own set of restrictions about when freight elevators, et cetera, can be. But it is a fair question and something we have brought back to DCAS. Fair enough that the city itself needs to do its part. Has the city, did the city plan it before the announcement, or is the city working right now as also the I mean, I think we're taking a look at it. I'm not going to tell you we have a, we don't have a fully fleshed plan yet because the the variety of city facilities is you know enormous. Okay. So my colleague has a question, and also I've been joined by Councilmember Levine, Councilmember Diaz, Powers, and Ku. Councilmember Diaz first, and we will have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioner. Let me read uh, a paragraph from your statement on page one, where it's a conjecture action plan you wrote. <clears throat> Facing greater conjecture than ever before, New York City is a victim of its own success with its thriving economy, a record 8.6 million residents and 62 million tourists. Last year, the city experiencing a period of remarkable growth that strained our transportation system daily. That's what you wrote. <clears throat> then, come to my attention that <clears throat> you have created a mess in where we are because if you if you are it seems to me that if I see something growing more people more traffic then I should plan to to open more streets and to span the street but you have been shrinking the streets and you are making, you have been making lines. If you are, you see more people coming and more cars, why are you shrinking the streets? Oops. So there's no question right now, as the city has grown, there are a lot of competing demands on our streets. And I, I think, you know, Inspector Fulton mentioned one thing that is certainly high on the mayor's list, which is Vision Zero which is designing the streets to be as safe as possible. So in some cases that is true, particularly in parts of the city where you have streets that were built very wide and you don't have that much traffic, we see that those are often some of the streets where we see the most crashes and the most fatalities and injuries. 
So there's not a one size, obviously a one size fits all prescription in the city. And I know some, certainly there's some people who feel the city should not be in the business of bus lanes and bike lanes, but I think from the, the de Blasio administration's point of view, we are trying to do our best to accommodate all the modes that we can on a, on a city street network that is, you know, we're not, we're not building new roads at the moment. And, and certainly I think at this point, um, there has never been a, a I'm, I'm fiercer not, competition for roadway space. I'm not saying to be new road. You are shrinking the road that we have. It. Well, again, I mean, you are you you're making it so impossible that you are. since you start doing this, the congestion start growing in the city. Now let's let's take for example the the bus lines. You got bus lines, especially for buses. So the private citizen, we cannot go into those lines. But those, the bosses don't stay in those lines. They come to our lines. So they, not only they have their, their specific line designed for, for the bosses, but they also take in our lines. And then there's a big example in the Bronx, in, right in front of the criminal courts in 161st. You got a bus line, and you got a line, right? But look at, look at how genius you design this. You got a bus line, but then the bus stop is not in the bus line. The bus stop is in the regular traffic line. So you got a bus line, and instead of putting the bus stop right there in the bus line, so the, the traffic could, could keep flowing, no. You put the bus stop right at the end with, of the traffic. So I'm saying, who's designing this? And we wish, what, what's the purpose? You're creating the mess. So it, it's interesting because I would say bus lanes right now have certainly become, Councilmember Diaz, one of the, the most fiercely contested things that we're doing in the city. And I, I, am, I invite you to I'm, come I'm, to the Bronx to 161st Premier Court and take a look at, at, court and at, take many a look of at your, that. Many of your colleagues here, led by the chairman, recently wrote me a letter and complained that the city was not doing enough to keep buses moving and that we should be installing the dedicated bus lane like the kind you're referring to on 161st Street at 10 places a year. So I think in this one there is a real lively tension between as the city has seen bus ridership decline and bus speed slow, a desire to do what we can to speed up buses because they carry a lot more people than vehicles and then obviously people who feel like we've dedicated too much street space to buses. So we are trying to strike that balance. Oops, all right. And what is, my last question, what, is it, what do you think that Uber has to do with all this? I, I, as I said in my testimony, I think they are clearly a big factor now. We have seen in the past couple of years that the, the four hire vehicles, the app-based vehicles, the Ubers, the Lyfts, that their growth is tremendous. And that furthermore, if you look at the research... Are you, are you in favor that Uber should be regulated? Well, yes. The, the mayor has, as you, as you probably know, the mayor in his first year in office came to the council with a... With a um, proposal to potentially cap the number of app-based vehicles. At, at that time, the council didn't, wasn't interested in it. He has recently said he would really be interested in revisiting that issue with the council. I'm looking forward for your support in when we're trying to regulate Uber and cut all those traffic in the city. Well, I, I think that is something he's interested in working with you Thank on. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Powers. Yes, thank you. Nice to see you. I, I actually am a supporter of uh, bikes, buck, uh, bikes and bus lanes, and I think I signed that letter, so count me as a supporter. Um, but it is coming to my district. I'm one of the three districts that's uh, receiving the, well, some, some of the regulations around parking and deliveries. So I had a few follow-up questions, and I know they sent a letter, and I know you guys responded. Um, the first one is just generally, when you get to the end of the six-month period, what is the definition of success and what, how, are we, how are we measuring that, and how will we as the representatives, council members, be able to work with you on the DOT to say, worked, didn't work, parts of it worked, and how, how, how is the DOT measuring that? It, it's a good question, and I wanna make clear, I, 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 I want us to be in good communication during the six months, so you all, and, you know, whatever frustrations you may have had with our prior communication, I don't want anyone to feel suddenly the end of the pilot comes and, and you don't know what's to come. I think, what, I mean, even what we're seeing, and I think as we've said, it, we don't wanna, we don't wanna judge the results on the ground quite yet, but it's been very early. But I think the, what we all instinctually know is when NYPD puts a lot of resources into a, into a corridor, 
they can really make a difference. I mean, I've been out on Flatbush and Roosevelt and, and just starting to see what's happening in Midtown. When they're there and, and their expert traffic agents are on the ground, it definitely speeds traffic speeds. But that said, we also know there are the local businesses, the buildings, the curbside uses. So I think we're going to need to look at all three pieces of the equation. Are we seeing significant improvements in traffic movement for vehicles, for taxis, for for hire vehicles, for buses? What are the impacts on local businesses and buildings? Have we worked through those? And is it a sustainable model for the PD in terms of enforcement? So I, I would just ask that we maybe before we go into the Midtown one, I know you're already up and running on the other ones, maybe put some criteria in place. And it's, it, it, I'm happy to you know, share some ideas on that too, but maybe a, what does is, what is traffic flow look like and defining that? Because I, my, only, my concern is that we are jumping into this with some expectations that it might work, and then we will not be able to, in six months, say it worked because, well, did we get more tickets or did we actually improve speeds in the, in the Midtown Corridor? So uh, th that's not to say, this is not, a, this is not a statement of opposition to it, it's a statement actually of how do you define whether it worked or not at the, at the end of six months. Uh, understood, and the mayor had, I mean, he had sort of set the bar for us, could we improve traffic speeds by 10% in the, in the pilot period? And I, you know, I think we'll see one, if, if that's achievable, and then two, again, sort of at, at what cost in terms of resources and how it's affecting business. So that at least is something of a benchmark we have to, to shoot for. Thank you, and I, 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 I won't go back to communications that we communicated, and I know that you have done outreach to the elected officials, and corrected me on the record of that, but, um, but I will note that um, Midtown, I think you guys mentioned doing Midtown outreach in March. That was at the last hearing of the budget. What I, I, I think I did express concern about, and I, I feel justified in saying that while I think you did do early stakeholder engagement, you named them, yeah, I, I, I can't refute that, and you did um, engage with both with my office and offices before that, um, uh, that the business is getting the outreach in late March with a few weeks to go does to me strike me as being, being late in the game uh, in terms of when they get notified. And then doesn't potentially some groups got early stakeholder engagement, but many of the businesses in that area would be getting it in late March. So I, I, I just remain, um, uh, I just wanted to re, you know, re-communicate that I think uh, uh, from what I've heard in both hearings, it started late and, and late March for mid-April does strike me as being late. I, I, I will admit, obviously, the, the territory we're trying to cover in Midtown is large, and you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying we could not have done better. We will continue to try and communicate with all the affected businesses, buildings, et cetera, and obviously, we, we would always welcome the help of elected officials' offices, community boards, the bids, et cetera. Thank you. And I have just a couple more questions, and then I'll, I'll have to run next door. But, um, uh, a, a, you know, there is presumably some category of vehicles that cannot abide by the delivery time uh, restrictions. I'm not stating who or what. There's presumably some that maybe do deliveries to a business. I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any schools in this district, but like a school delivery for food, as an example, or other types of businesses that would not be able to comply and would you have to just take a ticket. So have you guys identified any sectors so far that could not, could not do, could not, so it's simply, are simply just going to be revenue streams uh, or simply just going to be taking the enforcement action because they be either believe or they truly cannot live uh, under, the, under the proposal? I'll, I'll give an answer to that, and I, I think PD will want to speak on that as well. I, I think to reemphasize, we're not trying to do this as a revenue-raising exercise, and we do recognize, for example, we, we've talked to the, the heating oil industry, and we recognize, obviously, if a building needs heating oil, we don't want people to go cold, special considerations in the Diamond District, so I think there are certainly areas where you know, PD is going to use their discretion and enforcement, I'll let them speak to that. This is not the goal to just you know, the goal is to try and get the traffic flowing, not to write a thousand tickets. R right. Uh, we are not revenue producing agency. The NYPD is not in the business of making money by issuing summonses. A case in point would be that by law we need to wait five days to issue summonses once the signs are in place. We're going to give it five business days. We're going to wait so, uh, till I begin, believe we're going to begin Monday issuing summonses. We really could begin this week 
but we're going to give people extra time to get acclimated to the signs because we're not in the business of we want to get you. We want to we want to make sure that the the rules are followed, and sometimes we have to issue a summons because there are people that are inconsiderate of the rules, but. To answer your question, where there's a vehicle, and we haven't identified anybody that, like, we absolutely need to be here. But if there is, then the traffic agents and the police officers have discretion, and they won't issue a summons where the person needs to be there. If it's, if it, and I'll give an example, and of course, an ambulance would never get a, but if there's an oil delivery and they need it to, you know, it's a dead of winter, and they need the oil delivery, we're not going to issue a summons if the oil delivery, and they explain to the traffic agent, the traffic agent will move on. Okay, so basically, uh, I, we, we have a discretion, and we're going to issue it when we need to, and we're going to uh, be afforded discretion, and we're going to work with the community. We're all about neighborhood policing and working with the community to best serve it. And this plan, I think, was put in place to improve the quality of life of people and to improve traffic conditions, but not at the expense of some emergency situation where someone needs to make a delivery or there's an ambulance out front and or someone's, you know, parked there because there is an emergency of some kind I, that we can, I, you know. I hear you. I, I, I have two more questions, and I want to be respectful of my colleagues' time, so sorry to, sorry to cut you short. Um, uh, on, this, on the topic, and I, I would actually mention, and I appreciate the heating oil example, that if there are other industries, I know everybody's going to raise their hand on this, but if there are other industries that feel uniquely like they cannot comply with this, or will have difficulty complying, that perhaps at the outset we have some ways to flag them and ways to review, you know, tickets afterward on those particular industries. Um, and one of them that strikes me, you mentioned, is a diamond district, which is in my district and has unique challenges always around security. Obviously, the diamond district, by just by name, presents the challenge. Um, are there specific you don't have to outline exactly what's going on because of security, but can you tell me in terms of any specific examples like that, like the Diamond District, in terms of how those are going to be dressed in the sort of unique circumstances that exist? I mean, like I said, it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. The traffic agents are all deployed uh, in the different areas where they're going to have this plan in effect. And so the, the traffic agent will walk down the street. Now, the, you're in the Diamond District, are the vehicles identifiable? Because we will work with the business if, you know, they contact us and say, we have a, uh, a vehicle that looks like a Diamond District vehicle. I don't, I don't know if that's true. If there's no one in the vehicle and the traffic agent comes, they have a responsibility to issue a summons. Not, you know, sometimes there will be people getting summonses that are parked there. If, if there's something that you can relay to me that, is identifiable like that they have to be there at a certain location we certainly will work with you but so, so I, on that particular example I'd ask that we can have a chat afterwards because I think that does present unique circumstances that are outside of the purview of your normal uh, proposal for what it's yeah. worth and, and I would just said I was actually there yesterday on the block I saw one of your constituents Stephen Grower and we did talk through uh, some of the complexities on that block so we are sensitive that is probably one of the most challenging blocks yeah. in this thank whole you appreciate exercise. It. thank you and can I just ask one more question um, I, I'm just going to ask because we're on the topic is the administration have what what is a sort of updated administration's viewpoint on congestion pricing as a solution to a number of the problems that we're talking about but I, I mean I think what the mayor has said is the debate unfolded up in Albany was when the when the Fix NYC panel laid out, <coughs> laid out their proposal, excuse me, the mayor expressed his openness to it. He thought it was an improvement over previous congestion pricing proposals. He was a strong supporter of what the legislature has passed, which is the fee on the FHVs. And the mayor signaled a willingness to keep working with local officials here and state officials and the MTA on other potential solutions. Great. Thank you. And thank you for that position. And uh, I will, I'm going next door and I'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Member, before calling on Councilmember Kuhut, Commissioner, can we go back to the the incentive plan that the city had? We funded from the federal. How did the plan work? On a specific, for how long did the plan work? And what what was the experience that you can share with us with that plan? What changes happened on the that I plan? Mean, what we found, and this was this was some years this was some years back. It was in the previous administration. We did find there's no question that monetary incentives brought a bunch of, you know, building owners, store owners, et cetera, to the table. Because part of, you know, one of the barriers that they often talk about is not having that extra 
personnel on hand either early in the morning or later in the evening to receive the shipment. So I think for a lot of them, that incentive helped them defray those potential costs. Is there, and of course my suggestion is more than a question because I know that you are open to that. It's all about the money. We have limited resources. I just hope that, you know, through incentive, through EDC, and any other agency that we should definitely explore on how to create our own local municipality incentive to continue working. Because I think that regardless on the changes that you will see in the major plan, definitely in order to change the cultural, it's not only about those members of the industry who do the job delivering, it's about the receivers. And also we need to address what incentive do we provide for them? How can they deal with additional a worker that they need to receive those deliveries. So I just hope again that we will continue being open, definitely, uh, as they were meeting in the past. And I would like, I would like for a meeting, I will be calling for a meeting to the industry. Hopefully, if this is something that with DOT, you know, we can do it together. With, with DOT and as you say, maybe EDC and, and, and SBS too. Maybe we okay. can bring up so the I, I definitely will be, table. you know, working with you, okay. working with the industry to have a meeting with those additional agency also that you mentioned, and try to bring everyone together. This plan, you know, is there. Uh, this is something that is happening, you know, as, a, as a, you already said that there's some level of flexibility, but I just hope that that communication is there between NYPD and the stakeholder to talk about, you know, and that's between you, how, what is, what the flexibility mean? But that's not for me, you know, to it. I don't want to put you in the spot right now. On the no standing area, what can, is there any possibility that if the industry say, can we live with no standing in the morning or in the afternoon, that City Hall will be open to, you know, to keep the plan only in one of those evening or morning? I mean, look, I, I think as we move through the pilot project, and again, I want to stress, I don't want to wait till the end of the pilot to make these decisions. You know, that's part of the feedback we obviously want to get. I mean, is there some potential compromises that can, you know, work for all sides here? So, you know, let's just say we're, we're open to, to looking at any potential proposals and solutions that, that people want to put on the table. Okay, thank you. Council Member, Cabrera and Councilmember Reynoso. I also would like to acknowledge Councilmember Salamanca and Constantinides. Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Councilmember Kuhl, for allowing me to go uh, before you. Really appreciate it. Commissioner, welcome. Thank you for all the hard work uh, that you have performed for the city. Uh, I do want to share, I, I do echo uh, Councilmember Diaz's uh, frustration in certain places in the Bronx. Uh, so for example, in Pelham Parkway, there has never been a time that when I drive during, uh, in Pelham Parkway that the bus is not in the bus lane. And, and I sympathize with the bus uh, driver because in that lane you have, you have a design there for drainage. So you have a, uh, you know, you're having a, a, a catch uh, basin there that creates, you know, that bouncing effect. And so for them to avoid that, but it destroys the whole purpose of what we did in the first uh, place. So if you could have that discussion with MTA uh, in Fordham Row, uh, I seen it happen. I, I live in, in Fordham Hill, so I see it happen. And I see the frustration with MTA. Just yesterday, a big Mack truck decided to park to make deliveries right there and four of I was don't find it. And there was a police off, a transit police officer giving a ticket and he was just taking it like, you know, I'm taking my time. I'm, and at the end, the one who ended up paying for that is gonna be the consumer because that that is the fray. Uh, so I'm just sharing that bit of, of frustration. But the one, there's two things that I, I will hope you could address. Number one is my deep frustration with the lack of of the repair of the potholes in my district. That is slowing down traffic. I, I don't know what else to do but to ask you to personally address this because I see it done here in Manhattan, so it's not a weather uh, thing, and, and it's slowing down traffic in places and in other places 
there, there hasn't been no repairs for years, especially in those areas where they're made out of concrete. And, and it just causes, th these are things that we can actually control. There are things that I sympathize that we can't control here in the city. Uh, it's beyond our control. But that we could certainly control. And the second thing, if you could address, is one of my pet peeves in driving in the FDR. Uh, it's predictable every single day where traffic begins. It's in those exits, in the United Nations, 72nd Street. Is there any way to remediate that? Is there any way that we know what the problem is to expand that exit? Uh, there are creative ways that we could go about it because that just create a change reaction uh, traffic that literally uh, I see it happening throughout the city. And also, are you working with the state, for example, on the Major Deegan, where now we're getting like used traffic that I've never seen. Uh, I've never seen this traffic that now it just goes all the way back to Yankee Stadium way before that because it's past, it's no longer the bridge. Now we're looking beyond that, and it just, I see it just getting worse and worse by the day. Well, let me, <laughs> thank you, <Captain laughs> I just gave you let, a, let me try really a mouthful. Let me but. try and, and tackle all your questions. And I will say about the buses not being in the bus lane, it is a complaint I hear, and it's actually something that I have talked to now, the, the, the new president of New York City Transit, Andy Byford, he's mindful. And you're right, I mean, look, on Pelham Parkway, if, if, if now the catch basins are becoming a real barrier, we, we should, with DEP, we should go take a look at that. Thank I you. know he is, he is trying to remind the, the, the drivers to stay in the lanes, but you're right, sometimes there are vehicles blocking them, and so they go around them, but that is something he's certainly mindful of. On the potholes, um, I hear, you know, this is, as, as everyone knows, this is, April is the pothole month, obviously, as the city comes out of winter, and we have had a particularly challenging pothole season because we have had weird cycle of freezing and then warming up. The concrete roadways do present a real problem for us. The problem, as you probably know, is um, it's very hard to patch concrete with either asphalt or concrete. It tends not to stick. And you can't resurface a concrete road like you can just tra traditional asphalt roads. You have to really go back, take off the concrete, and rebuild it. it. It's quite expensive and difficult to do. But if there are if there are places in your district that you think we're not getting giving good attention to, obviously I would like to get that list from you, and we will make I, sure I, we we get to them. I will just say April is always it is our worst pothole month. Michelle, I welcome you to come and see the craters. It feels like the moon. Uh, driving through the uh, area, I, I, it, it, it's just. I, it's I will. I'll, I'll be happy to come. And then on your, the last point about traffic, FDR, Major Deegan. I mean, th some of those FDR exits are also the state. And again, as part of this initiative, as I mentioned in my testimony, I have talked to my counterpart at the state, Commissioner Karras, and we are going to sit down together and take a look at some of the pinch points on the city-state network and see what we can do. So obviously, we'll take feedback on where we you think we should look. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Koo. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Koo, followed by Councilmember Reynoso and Levin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Chartenberg and your staff uh, for providing good leadership in our city in transportation. You know, uh, actually, I think congestion is part of the side effect of prosperity, you know? so. So it's good that we have congestion, but we have to solve it. Just like we, are, we eat too much, we have to find some ways to exercise and decrease our cholesterol, you know? Then, yeah, this is traffic, yeah. Uh, in, in my part of uh, district, you know, downtown fashion is really busy, you know? And a lot of complaints uh, are about the bus lanes because they don't see the buses there all the time. You know? They want to see bus once in a while. Every 15 minutes, 10 minutes, there's a bus. And then the time is not uniform. Because sometimes it's at 7 to 7 p.m., sometimes it's at 7 um, to 12. Uh, and it doesn't say what time the other drivers can use it. Because it's like a, a waste of uh, a lane there. You know, because right now we have a bus lane, then we have a regular lane. And all the regular cars drive on the regular lane, and then when they make a turn, all the tra traffic stop. Right? Meanwhile, the bus lane is empty uh, most of the time. 
So the complaint is, why don't we, how do we utilize the bus lane more? So, I mean, and obviously, as and you know, the, especially the off hours, you know, we, we, we've, I've spent some time in your district with you and there's no question downtown flushing. I mean, if we're having a hearing on congestion, it is one of the, it is, as we've said before, it's got congestion like Times Square. I mean, the one thing, as you know, because we've, we've worked with you on the select bus service there, you, you have some of the highest volumes of bus ridership in the whole city there. So. I mean, I have to say, usually when I'm in the neighborhood, I'm amazed at the number of buses that I do see. I mean, happy to come out again and see, you know, if we want to take a look at the, the hours or the signage, but I, I do think in that neighborhood, you have tremendous, tremendous bus ridership. And, you know, one of our goals of the, the Flushing to Jamaica line was to try and improve that trip for those, you know, tens of thousands of people using buses in that neighborhood. Another question I have is the, on the deliveries. No, a, a lot of small business owners, they don't use, nay, nay, they're not like Costco or to the Walgreens. They don't have trust delivery. Sometimes they go to buy stuff themselves. They go to Costco, they go to cash can carry places, to buy sodas, the cases, or milk or whatever. And they carry it back to their, their stores. But right now, they have a hard time to park. Now, because once they park, uh, in all those low standing or whatever, you know, just even a few minutes, they get ticket. So it's not fair for the, the small business owners. They are not officially hiring a delivery truck. They are doing it themselves. So how do we alleviate the problem and help these small really mom and pop stores? Right? They buy stuff themselves. Well, I'm, I'm gonna take a crack at that and, and, and my PD colleagues may wanna answer too. I mean, look, it's, it's part of the, the experiment here with this pilot is to see if we can find a way to strike that balance. And I, I can't claim that it's easy. You know, I will say I think on the busiest quarters in the city during the busiest hours of the day, I mean, I think we have all observed this, one car pulls over and stops and sits there and hundreds of vehicles back up. So I think, I certainly know that's one of the things the mayor felt the frustration about and what he was hoping this, this pilot might help us see if we could reduce. I don't know if PD wants to speak to yeah, that as well. Just um, <clears throat> quickly, so the traffic agents do a, I think, terrific job. Um, they go out and they enforce these summonses and sometimes the summonses the double park is, the parking in the uh, bus lane, the parking in the bike lane. These summonses are not only, uh, uh, are uh, the, the violator is putting the pedestrians at risk. The, sometimes the pedestrian will walk between the double uh, cars. There's visibility, decreased visibility. So we want them to issue summonses. Um, as far as, uh, you know, like I said, I'm going back to the discretion. The, they are afforded this, uh, a discretion and, and they don't want to, you know, issue to people uh, that are just, you know, sitting in their car, so they'll ask them to move. But some people, like, I, th I would think it's better for the business if there is, if they're sitting on a metered parking, they leave their car there for a certain, because you can pay with the meter and, and put the you know, muni meter there, the turnover is better for business and stuff. So they, the, the traffic agents serve a, a very valuable function so that, you know, we can always work. If there is some, something that we can do, we're in, you know, we want to be helpful, but the summonses uh, do have value when they do write them. So the last question is how do you increase turnover on the meter parkings? Because I see a lot of cars parking all day long, especially insurance cars or some of the other trucks. They use it as their own warehouse there. This is part there. No, well, people, people were doing business on the streets and the vendors. They just park their trucks and the meters. They park there all day long. And, and the insurance cars. Well, they sell the insurance. They park there from line to and they, wherever the whole day they're there. If you give me the locations, I will take it back and we'll send out an agent to make sure that the people aren't violating. So we have to find some ways to increase the turnover of the meter parkings so other people can park. You know. Great. Sorry, Councilman Reynoso, I made a mistake, it was, second one, it was followed by Salamanca and Living, that's okay. <laughs> Whatever you negotiate. All right, good morning, good morning, Commissioner. Um, so, just a couple of things. I, I have to start with the, the state's congestion pricing plan, um, and I know that they have, they've, they've had to cut it up in phases because of politics. Um, but the overall plan for a lot of us that have been fighting for congestion pricing for quite some time, it's a breath of fresh air to see some of the concepts that are important 
to the plan related to mitigation, um, revenue generation, and and actual uh, decrease in 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 congestion. You know, again, it's a breath of fresh air. I just when I when I see this, it's so underwhelming. It's so I, I think you're supposed to increase like movement by 0.5 miles an hour overall through this. It's a 10% increase. This I think I saw this exact map last time two years ago. I think you showed it to us. This one that that's uh, clear curbs and, and clear we, lanes. We showed it to you in November of, of last year. Okay, so a year ago, uh, well, November of last year, uh, and it's just underwhelming. I, I see you specifically as like the one of the foremost experts and like you know a thought intellectuals when it comes to transportation policy, and I feel like this this administration is falling so short from from what I think even your legacy would speak to could speak to, and I, I just want you to like this this is nonsense. This hearing is nonsense. It's a waste of time when we're talking about actually dealing with a problem that's related to true congestion. Um, clearing the box, uh, what is it, what do you, the box, box, the box, the box, for example, that happens because a car has a green light, moves, and the cars in front of him don't move, or the, in front of that person don't move, and now that person is stuck in the middle, he's going to get a ticket, or she's going to get a ticket, right, like, th those type of things are just what gets uh, these, uh, gets, you know, commuters and, and car drivers and just New Yorkers so upset. So that when we do something like congestion pricing or want to push something that's real, they don't even buy in because we're giving them tickets for blocking the box, right? Because that's what we think is going to make us happy. This doesn't make me happy. I think it's underwhelming. I don't think it's a real congestion plan. I think enforcement is weak across the board when it comes to bike lanes, when it comes to placards all over the place, uh, deliveries, taxis. I see these signs all the time, I, and and you have to drive all these all these cars end up having to drive around these that one car that's parked on the block or those two cars that are parked on the block, and then they hold everything up. It's just again, I, I think this hearing for me is is underwhelming and a waste of time when it comes to actually dealing with congestion, and and I'm and I, I feel sorry. I'm 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 concerned about the fact that you even have to be up here presenting what I think is inconsequential um, suggestions to a problem that's so grave, and it's a crisis, and we treat it. <laughs> We're talking about 0.5 miles an hour. It's a crisis. Well, I'll, I'll take just a second to respond to that, and just to remember, when, we, when the mayor put this plan out, he said at the time, this isn't congestion pricing, which has to be done at the state level. This is basically experimenting with the tools the city has, and I don't, I don't think he in any way claim that this was the grand solution to congestion. I certainly wouldn't claim that either. Uh, I, I think it is to sort of experiment with enforcement and see, again, if we can move the needle balancing business needs, balancing NYPD resources. I don't, I don't want in any way want to pretend this is the definitive answer, but I, I think as we have said, obviously the debate has advanced in Albany, as you point out. The governor had his Fix NYC panel. They put a phased approach on the table. The mayor, I think, has evolved in his views, expressed certainly openness to that plan, thought it was an improvement over prior plans. We are enthusiastic about step one, which is the FHV fees, and ready to work on upcoming phases. So I, I don't, I don't, I think we've had this discussion, I don't think these are mutually exclusive tracks. This one is certainly smaller than a big congestion pricing plan would be, but since that's happening at the state level, you know, this is some of our, you know, basically pilots at the city level. We should let the we should let the governor be the one that's petty about this situation. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge fan of the governor, but he is right. He's doing a good job on the congestion pricing plan that they put forward in the Fix NYC was a good plan. The mayor supporting that, endorsing it, would be a step in the right direction to show New Yorkers that they care more about the city of New York and, and actually moving than about their petty politics. This plan is the right plan. There should be an endorsement and modifications as you see fit. You should make recommendations as to how that would be modified to make it work. And a millionaire's tax is not the answer. Congestion pricing is something that they're bought into. Let's, let's support it and start seeing how we can move forward. This is, this is, again, so inconsequential to the greater plan of congestion when it comes to the city of New York. And it'll, you know, there'll be headlines, but we, we've accomplished very little today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Commissioner, and 
members of the department, great to see all of you. Um, the for hire vehicle fees are commonly described as a first step towards congestion pricing. Uh, I truly welcome the revenue that's going to be um, created for mass transit thanks to those fees. I, I do wish we had gone a little bit easier on the yellows in that equation because of the burden that they're carrying uh, on other fronts. Um, but I just don't think it's correct to call that uh, an anti-congestion plan. Uh, I don't see fewer taxi rides um, because of this. And I wonder if you could comment on, on your prediction on the extent to which this will reduce congest congestion in the central core. Right. I, I, th I think, uh, Councilor Levine, I think you're largely right about that. And again, I, I had mentioned before referring to the research I think a lot of people have seen by Bruce Schaller that points out that the, the demand right now for, for FHVs is pretty inelastic. Um, people are not that price sensitive. And that the congestion behavior is not so much them driving over a cordon at 60th Street or, or coming over the FDR Drive. It's the congestion is mainly being caused by them cruising around the Midtown area. And I, I don't think this fee really gets at that behavior. But I don't want to say it'll have no effect. Um, you know, any pricing will, on the margin, have some effect. And it will certainly generate revenue for the MTA, which I think is a goal everybody shares at this point. The revenue piece is huge, absolutely. So how many cars enter the Central Business District every day? That's or a, how many vehicles of all types, that's commercial, a good question, private? But maybe someone will dig up for me as we're sitting I, here. And, I believe I, the number is a million is, into Manhattan. I think it's a million and something. And I think what's interesting is that number has actually stayed pretty steady, even declining a little bit. The, I think a lot of the congestion we're seeing in Manhattan has been caused by all the other things we're talking about, the, the construction, the pedestrians, the, now the growth of the FHVs who are cruising on the local streets. It has not been caused that much, as you're pointing out, by people crossing into Manhattan. And we'll get those numbers, but it's been pretty steady. Right, there may be, it may be that cars are spending more time on the street, but um, at the end of the day, we're not gonna have clear streets if a million vehicles are coming in. It's just the geometry and the laws of physics. Well, that is, that is true. Don't allow that. <laughs> so we need to reduce the number of vehicles entering the core, and there are various ways to do that, but there's no better way than a strategy which also generates uh, desperately needed funding for mass transit so that people have an alternative uh, am, am, I, am I correct in my assessment? And is, is there any other strategy other than congestion pricing that could effectively reduce the entrance of a million vehicles into the core district? I mean, I, I, I will be a little cautious in what I say in that, I mean, obviously congestion pricing is something that is being debated up at the state level. And I think as you've looked, for example, at the Fix NYC panel and the different suggestions they made, um, you know, you have to do a certain amount of adjusting to have a real effect on traffic. And the example I'll refer to is in London, where they charged fairly high one-time fees to come into their cordon area. But over time, people just internalized those fees. And the reduction, uh, you know, the congestion benefits started reducing. So I think, you know, certainly congestion pricing can have effect on congestion, but the contours of what that looks like and what its effects are is not something that you can speak to easily and obviously I think requires a lot of discussion and debate up in Albany. Right, I understand that, but in this case, if, if you did nothing more than generate uh, hundreds of millions for mass transit, it would be uh, a victory in itself. And there is innovative pricing that particularly for four hires uh, adds a cost per, per mile traveled or per per minute spent, uh, we have that technology now. Um, and I think some of the economists have, have suggested that as, as better than simply a fee for crossing the cordon. Um, to me, the solution here is obvious. There's only one solution that will both uh, get cars off the street, that will generate the revenue that we needed, and, uh, and that is congestion pricing. Um, what was improved in Albany uh, cannot accurately be called congestion pricing. It is a welcome revenue generation measure for mass transit, but uh, it probably won't be more than that. So uh, this fight continues, and we, we would welcome the administration as an ally in that fight, and you yourself as the leader of our transit agency, um, and it's one that I and many of my colleagues are going to continue to advocate for in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Number.
Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, um, Chair. How are you, Commissioner? Um, Commissioner, um, uh, two questions. I want to talk about uh, sidewalks. Uh, my first question in terms of SBS services. Uh, um, recently, a few months ago, they uh, added SBS services, uh, select bus services in my district, uh, which I can say um, residents of my community are extremely happy with. Um, I know that uh, in our discussions, they were concerned about a certain intersection that's extremely busy, overcrowded, congested, and um, the DOT have put some traffic control agents there certain hours of the day to ease the traffic, and I can say that their presence there makes a big difference. I'm glad to hear and, that. And, and I really hope that we can continue having conversations on how to keep, keep them there permanently. Um, I will look to my PD colleagues on that one as well. Yeah, and so I can use your help on that. Um, so, um, but my question is, in terms of SBS services, so there's lanes. The, the main concern that the community had was the lanes that were taken over for the SBS services, uh, for the buses, um, and their 24-hour lanes. But in Manhattan, in the city of New York, in, in Manhattan, I know that there are certain lanes that are 7 to 7. Am, am I correct? Yes. Uh, how can we relook at the lanes in my district uh, to have them similar to the lanes, the, the hours that they, are in, uh, that, that they are in Manhattan in terms of 7 to 7? Yeah, the, the, this, this, and, and just one thing sort of to, to remind council members, the SBS program has been, um, we've been rolling out routes now over a 10 year period. And so admittedly, sort of things have evolved over time. And, you know, we are happy to go and take a look at hours. Sometimes we've put in the 24 hours because the SBS, and I, I, I gotta refresh my memory about the particulars of your route. In some places we've done it because we're not only trying to improve bus service, but we're also trying to make the street safer. And often we find at night, taking that lane and keeping it as a dedicated bus lane means you're in fact narrowing the street and reducing speeds and reducing crashes and fatalities. So that can sometimes be the reason for the 24 hours. But again, happy to take a look at segments of the route if, if you'd like us to come back. I would really like to have, continue having that conversation okay. with your agency uh, to see if that's something that's feasible. Okay. Again, I do not want to delay the buses. Uh, but if there's a certain hours of the day in which there would not be a delay and we can open up these lanes, it, it would be helpful. Right, again, usually it's the determination has been a safety-related one. Yeah. Um, then lastly, in terms of sidewalks, um, I, I do work with Parks Department, constantly reaching out to them where there's sidewalks that are lifted because of trees, uh, the roots. Uh, the majority of these sidewalks, for some reason, in my district are in front of homes, homeowners, uh, two, two, three family homeowners. Um, and recently, uh, I called in DOT, I had a complaint. There was a particular homeowner, no tree in front of her home, but her sidewalk was in very bad condition where uh, individuals with wheelchairs or even baby carriages could not walk through. It, 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 there was a hazard there. And so DOT came to do an inspection, but they ended up doing an inspection in about uh, a three a three block radius throughout all home all homeowners, and because of this particular complaint, I got flooded by other homeowners who got something in the mail saying, "Hey, you need to fix your sidewalk," and it could be very minor cracks. Um, some of these homeowners are seniors, and so they got a letter stating that if they don't fix it, DOT will send someone out fix it for them, and there will be a cost attached to this. Well, what programs does DOT have? for those homeowners who may not have the, the means uh, to, to fix these sidewalks. Right, at, at, at the moment, um, and I, we, we discussed this earlier in the testimony, at the moment the city does not have a program to you know, basically help homeowners pay to fix their sidewalks. So you know, again, if that's something the, the council is interested in exploring, we can talk to you about that. It is true, uh, one of your colleagues asked about this earlier, it is true that the, the sidewalk violation program is very complaint driven. and. As a matter of efficiency, if I'm sending an, you know, it's a big city, I've got over 12,000 miles of sidewalks. If I send an inspector to a particular location to look at one complaint while they're in the neighborhood, they're going to look at adjoining areas because it's just not efficient for me to have them just go look at one complaint in all five boroughs. So, you know, I, I will sometimes have council members complain to me about a particular um, 
location, and we, we do try and be upfront about the fact if we come to your neighborhood to look at that location, we will be looking at other nearby sidewalks. And oh, I, ha I actually have the head of my sidewalk program here. Maybe he wants to add something, Leon Hayward. Yeah, the, w the one thing that I add is that uh, there was a time when we went simply to the property that lodged the complaint, but what we found out was that we get called back to the block two and three more times right after. So therefore, it became efficient for us to look at the entire block face when we go, and that's what we do. We look at an entire block face when we come to that one complaint because we know that if we just look at that property, we will get calls to come back to the block again. And once the homeowners get the notice, uh, how, many, how, how many days go by until the city comes or turns around and says, we're gonna do this work ourselves? It, 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 it depends, of course, complicated answer. So the city goes to about nine community boards a year to do sidewalk work. So if 59 community boards, so we come to every community board about once every five years. So it really depends when we get the complaint about whether, you know, wh where that, com that particular community board is in our schedule. On average, it's taking us a number of years to get to a particular complaint. And we've also found when the homeowner themselves does the repair, that on average takes about three and a half years. So it's, it's not all that frequent that particular sidewalk complaints get fixed in a timely way unless they happen to be in the community boards we will be visiting in that construction season. All right, and then my last question is, uh, the sidewalks that are uplifted because of the tree routes, um, the tree routes, uh, I mean, uh, what's your relationship with parks? Is it solely on parks to get these sidewalks repaired, or is there a joint venture with DLT and parks department to get them done? It, it, it is a joint venture, um, and parks has recently been given more funds, thanks to the mayor and the council, to do more of this repair of damaged sidewalks because of tree roots. Our two systems are kind of different, so of course it, it makes it a little complicated. Again, we're going community board by community board. So anytime we're in a community board, if there are uh, defects caused by tree roots, which are city responsibility, we will fix them. Parks uses a different system. They go where, they prioritize and they go to the places where they see the most amount of damage. But I am also gonna say neither agency has the resources at the moment to get to all of those complaints in a, in a given year. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Ross. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Uh, I like that you have read on today for gender equity pay. Yes? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks. I'm all for it. All right. Um, I just have two questions. Could you provide us with more information about the clear zones and what types of congestion mitigation measures are being taken in the targeted areas, but specifically the North Shore of Staten Island? Right, and, and look, a, 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 as you know well, and you've been very much a, a part of this and, and a, a leader in what's going on there, we have very big challenges on, on the North Shore of Staten Island. And we have obviously growing development and density and congestion there. We now do, I think, finally have the outlet mall schedule to come in this year. And as you know, it's been part of a very long process with EDC, DOT, NYPD to do a number of mitigations, things we're doing on the ferry side, enhancing ferry service, going to lower level boarding. Um, we're making, we've done some markings and other improvements on, on Bay Street, on Victory Boulevard, putting bike lanes in on Van Duzer, and putting bike lanes connecting to the ferry, and then working with EDC, as you know, potentially on some, some bigger capital projects. We are also, you know, as the outlets start to come in and we start to see what the traffic patterns look like, and look, one concern we do have is we did think with the wheel coming in, there would be a lot of people who would come over on the ferry, visit the wheel, and then go to the outlets. You know, the, it looks like the situation with the wheel is uh, maybe, you probably yeah. know more than I, but a little uncertain at the moment. And so I do think now we're potentially seeing more of a, uh, you know, a vehicle-driven potential pattern. So as soon as we start to see that early traffic, we'll have our engineers on the ground looking at signals and what are some of the other improvements we're going to But obviously working closely with you and the borough president, uh, you know, we know it's a, it's, a, it's a big challenge on the North Shore right now. 
So um, you're looking to sort of mitigate the traffic, or are you trying to generate, um, are you trying to discourage people from using well, I think their we're, cars? I, mean, we're, I, I, would, I would put it differently. We're certainly trying to encourage people to use other modes. Obviously, we, we particularly want people to use the ferry. We very much, as you know, increased and improved ferry service in recent years, and obviously that's such a great way to travel. It's free. You can leave your car behind. Uh, come see the sites of Staten Island. But we're also, again, working with local PD precincts on the ground to try and do the best we can to accommodate traffic as it comes, but also, as you know, build out some of the bike network, too, in hopes maybe some folks will, will choose to ride a bike or walk. And um, what is the status of the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Staten Island Expressway, Verrazano, Narrows Bridge, Gowanus Expressway Corridor, Clear Highways Task Force? Well, it's a Has good it question, and, and we are at the early stages of that. I have talked to my counterpart at the state level, Commissioner Karras, and we've agreed, and obviously we will want local elected officials and state elected officials to be a part of it. We're going to convene soon to talk about are there potential things we can do to improve? And, and the city and the state have worked together um, on the Grand Central. There are, there are certain state-owned routes where we've been able to work together to improve exits, to add lanes, to improve clearances. So there are some things we can potentially do on those routes, and we are going to get together very soon with electeds and stakeholders to talk through some of those potential solutions. I'm not going to promise miracles. Those are, those are obviously all challenging roadways, but... I think we can brainstorm and potentially come up with some improvements. Is the cantilever project a part of those discussions? Well, well, that's really its own on its own separate track. And, and as some of you may be aware, we were we were very fortunate to get the ability to do design build for that project in this this latest session up in Albany, and we are starting the planning on that in earnest. Um, and obviously, we're going to have a lot of outreach on that. As you correctly surmised, that has traffic impacts backing up all the way to Staten Island, all the way up into Queens. And you know that, that will be a big all-hands-on-deck project in its own right. But at least now with the Design Build Authority, we're hoping we can at least maybe shave it as much as two years off the, that project, which will, yeah, I think, be a you know, tremendous benefit for, for, again, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Queens. And um, who will the stakeholders be that will be on the uh, task force? The well, again, task I think largely elected officials, but I, you know, certainly um, I think we want to talk to sort of major business and civic groups that might have an interest in some of this. So, but I think we'd like to get with you all and get your ideas on who we should have at the table. Okay. And do you have an idea of when you might convene this? I'm going to say th there's, there's many things up in the air, but I'm, I'm going to say in the next couple of months, we'll try and convene it. Okay. Thank you. I'm now going to be giving the opportunity to Councilman Power to ask his one or two questions. You fine? I got an off-topic question, uh, and, and, and thank you again for being here and uh, answering our questions. And um, uh, just off-topic for a second, uh, uh, L train. When when is the new proposal coming out around the L train? I think you said maybe it's this month. The, the L, well, we're going to be doing town halls this month. Um, I'm sure many of your constituents will want to attend. And then shortly thereafter, I think end of this month into early May, because we want to make sure, again, we, we heard loud and clear that we wanted to do more robust town halls, uh, East Village, West Village, Williamsburg. We're going to also be doing uh, with the MTA uh, an open house out in Ridgewood to make sure we're hearing you know, from folks in Queens who I think are particularly focused on the subway service element. We want to make sure we get all that feedback and incorporate it into our final plan, but we know we got to get out quickly with what we want to sort of put on the table as the final proposal. Thank you. And, and now going on topic, because I, I had a question earlier that I didn't, I didn't get to. Um, we did talk a lot about the off night, the off hours deliveries. I know you mentioned a federal grant that allowed you to do a program around that. and. And you know, I, look, I think everybody's fa you know everybody's favorite thing here would be to get um, where where possible because I didn't mention I think there's some that will have a tougher time to do the off hours is and I and I may have missed uh, uh, some part of the conversation on this but is there further thoughts or consideration on more voluntary programs e either based on what happens now or after the six month period around off hours um, and how does one engage, I mean, what, 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 you know, 
some people are going to have to choose to opt in to do that if it's a voluntary program. But can you give us just any more information on on what ideas might exist around trying to shift incentives? You mentioned maybe not trying to give incentives, but um, maybe there's other ways to shift and, and where the agency is on looking at that. Yeah, we, we do have an existing off-hour deliveries voluntary program, and we do go out and work with businesses and the industry. Um, I think, look, there, frankly, there's more to do on that score. I, I won't deny it. And you know, I see we have a lot of industry representatives in the room, and we want to continue that discussion with them. I do think that, I'm not going to lie, I think the incentives helped. And it's really a policy question, and I, I think in part a policy question for council members um, about whether that's something the city wants to invest its own funds, and it was an easier decision when it was a federal grant. Um, you know, it's not a decision the city has made yet to, you know, reimburse local businesses if they want to hire extra staff. But, you know, we, 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 look, one thing we certainly recognize that this, this pilot has done for better or for worse is really bring that conversation to the fore. And, you know, we certainly, we certainly know our agency and I think small business services uh, you know, should step up and do more to try and make that, that program a robust one. And, and what was the source of the grant? Just, yeah, just, I don't know anything about it. The source of the money that from, came from the federal government, why it wasn't renewed? And we, I, we have was, a lot I mean, it was a USDOT program. Some, the USDOT at one time had a bunch of sort of interesting grants that they were giving out to cities to tackle these kinds of things. You know, these, these federal grant programs come and go. This was, this was one that didn't survive in the out years, unfortunately. And it was a grants program to businesses to do off hours? It, it was, yeah, it was, I think it was a grants program that came to the city and then um, maybe someone will refresh my memory if I have this wrong and then we, we dispersed a local business. And how much was the total grant? It was not a lot of money. I don't know if someone can find it. I mean, I think it was, you know, in the single digits of the millions, but we'll, we can get you that number. And, and sorry, one last question. I don't know if I'm on the clock or not, but uh, what businesses adopted off hours as a result? Have, have, have businesses permanently adopted the off hours? And if so, maybe any insight on why yeah, I mean, they decided? Some have, and I think not surprisingly, the businesses that have been most able to do it are the bigger chains a CVS, a you know, Whole Foods, you, you know, chains where they're getting, a, they're getting so many deliveries that it really makes sense for them to do some of that work at night. But, you know, we do face the challenge here in New York of, you know, even some of the largest businesses, supermarkets, et cetera, are in residential areas. And so that's always a challenge uh, in terms of local residents not wanting a lot of truck traffic at night, something we also need to work through. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't leading here, but then that reminds me that potentially the smallest businesses are the ones who get more hurt in a, or, or have more stress on them. So smaller supermarket versus a chain, the smaller business that relies on deliveries rather than a village one. If the chains can do it, and God bless them, they have a huge footprint in the city, um, then it leaves some that can and will have to have a harder stress in this moment. So I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that point, but it makes me recognize that uh, in the in this sort of moment. But um, look, I, I would restate uh, work, being willing to work with the administration on things like congestion pricing, which while have their own stresses on businesses and deliveries, I think creates a, a different, a clearer playing field and a clearer set of rules. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a question off topic. Uh, which is for Leon, from the, related to the sidewalk, and and again, this is not for the homeowners. This is about, and I don't know if it's under your responsibility. There's a big problem that we have, and and and, and I brought to the commissioners, you know, how we need to also look at sidewalk because right now there's different agencies that they have different responsibility when it comes to sidewalk. And this is not, again, this is not about sidewalk related to the home owner, but this is about in the commercial area. There is a business owner that I have, San Nicolas Avenue between 180 and 181st. Local Inspector Mundo been trying to do the best he can but the business improvement district has been trying to do the best they can. That business owner is not using yes the three feet that they have the right to. They take the whole area, and it's like a very congested area. 
is at the exit of the one trains at Nicholas Avenue. So not only that business owner take, and I even have a photo, I will show you later on, the last one last week. Not only she take most of the space of the sidewalk, but she parked a big truck in that area too, and even in the other side of the street. And this is very not inspector business improvement district, and this is about they get some, you know, penalty three days after you go back to the same reality. So I hope that we can work on this particular case because again, this is not about, you know, allowing the business owners to use the area of the sidewalk that they, that they, that they had the right to. This is about using 90% of the sidewalk in a very congested, pedestrian congested area is taken by that particular person. And it's like, the way they do it is like putting the face of everyone. There's no law enforcement, there's no business from the district, there's no elected official, there's no complaint that fix that problem. So, again, off the topic from the homeowner sidewalk, but I would like to see how we put a solution to that problem that it bring a lot of complaints involving many sectors, and I hope that I need your help in that particular case. It, with that, uh, Commissioner, as I said before, uh, DOT been leading uh, together with us Car Free Day, which will take place Saturday 21st, closing Broadway from uh, 47 to Fortune Street, San Nicolas Avenue. Many of the private, public, and academic sector, they are part of this. And thank you to that. I would like to encourage you, if it's possible, the next panel is gonna be we have three panels, but the first one is gonna be, the first two, they are the industry. So if by any chance, it only will be the first five individuals, three minutes each. If you can hear, then it will be very important for me. Thank you. So with that, let's call the first panel. Uh, Nelson Eusebio from the National Supermarkets Association. Alex. Axel Carrion from UPS, Patrick Highland from the Metro Truck Association, Jessica Walker, President of Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, and Alice Slackley from the AAA. So each of you will have three minutes. Please summarize and, and thank you, Commissioner, again for stay for at least for the first panel. Hi, Councilman. I'm Jessica Walker, the president of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as you know, we represent businesses uh, here in the city, and we really consider ourselves a guardian of small businesses and startups in particular. Uh, I'll speak briefly today. I just wanted to um, acknowledge that we actually, uh, we are very supportive of the congestion pricing plan, Fix NYC, uh, so we understand that this is a big issue. Um, and in fact, we do support the stepped up enforcement of blocking the box that was talked about earlier today. Um, but specifically, I want to talk about concerns with the Clear, Cuts, uh, Clear Curves program. Um, we did a cursory survey. Our office is actually in the, uh, in the zone, uh, the pilot zone that's happening in Manhattan. So we did a cursory survey of affected businesses. Um, it was supposedly took effect uh, a week from yesterday, April 2nd, um, but there was a big snowstorm. So we actually went out yesterday. Um, we were able to speak with 19 businesses in the affected zone, and I'll just report on sort of what we learned. 14 of the 19 said that they received deliveries within the uh, two windows that are now disallowed under the pilot. So this is just giving you sort of um, background on what they have been doing. Two of the remaining five said that their items are being delivered by UPS and FedEx, so the time usually varies somewhat. So that just made it a little uh, difficult for them. An additional one of the businesses is actually a FedEx store on 48th Street. 
Um, and the manager there said that there isn't much they can do to alter their deliveries and pickups. Now, um, in terms of the issue of awareness, that's sort of one of our big concerns here. 13 of the 19 businesses we spoke with yesterday said that they were not notified of the congestion pilot. One of those 13 was aware of the plan, but only because he read about it in the news. Six of the 19 businesses were notified by a flyer that was created by DOT, uh, and I, I assume that's the ambassador's program that was discussed today. Um, but no one that we spoke with has seen anything actually being enforced in that area at this point, and no one has reported any tickets, um, which we thought was interesting. Um, yesterday, when a member of my staff actually called the Manhattan DOT office, because like I said, we'd heard that there was a lot of enforcement happening in the other pilot areas that we just weren't seeing um, in our area. Um, but so yesterday, when a staff member of mine called the Manhattan DOT office phone number that was listed on the flyer, they needed to, uh, they were told that they needed to check to see if it was still uh, indeed being implemented. So there's a lot of confusion that's happening here. Um, and again, one of the businesses said that they've actually been, uh, they found it to be sort of a hassle because they're complying with the rules just in case, but as of now they have not seen enforcement. So we're not really sure um, what's happening or if there has been a whole lot of enforcement as of yet. But in general, I just want to point out that sort of the, the cursory survey that we did, I think it really does show that there's confusion. Folks don't really know what's happening. And I think that overall, we would like to see the process slow down a little bit. Um, some of the issues came out today with the questioning, but it doesn't appear that uh, much study went into the potential impacts that uh, could, uh, could be brought to bear on the affected businesses in that zone. Um, it obviously seems like there was late outreach that happened just a few weeks, uh, a few weeks ago starting. Um, so we'd be happy to work with the council and DOT to try to solve that. Thank you. And let's follow Jessica, three minutes each. If you need to summarize, please you do so. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for holding this hearing, for allowing me to address the committee. My name is Patrick Highland, and I am the executive director of the Metropolitan Trucking Association. Our association represents employers who hire Teamster Local 282 drivers to operate their trucks performing heavy construction throughout the five boroughs. I am here today to address the recent initiative to address, which is addressing congestion in select neighborhoods here in the city. Our members deliver and haul various aggregate supplies to and from heavy construction, construction sites, excuse me. Restricting their access during peak hours to any area of New York City where there's heavy construction is a problem for us on several fronts. But the primary issue here is schedule. Our members may put their trucks out as early as 5 a.m. in order to get to the sites being staffed by Building Trades members before 7 a.m. when these projects typically begin in da for daily construction schedules. But the heavy construction industry is hardly ever a one-run job for our members. It typically requires two, three, sometimes four runs per day. Stopping construction production for certain time frames on these large-scale projects is really just a non-starter. The initiative would lengthen project scope and drive up costs significantly for projects in certain zones. And this brings us to night construction, which is often a response when these concerns are raised. Yes, our members do perform night construction. They perform night construction at sites where night construction makes sense logistically. Belt Parkway, Staten Island Expressway, Bayonne Bridge, Kosciuszko Bridge, Gothels Bridge, JFK Airport, LaGuardia Airport, etc. They do not perform night construction in residential neighborhoods of the city that never sleeps. This plan causes logistical hurdles for several industries, and you can add heavy construction to the list. New York City Council recently passed a well thought out and executed rezoning of East Midtown. It has been praised from numerous sources, and the prevailing belief is that this rezoning will stimulate economic growth for this region of Manhattan. We agree and applaud the council for their work and the mayor for his work on this plan. But does it make sense to restrict trucks access into an area where construction activity will see an increase? We do not think so either. I could go on and on, but in the interest of time and out of respect for others who wish to speak today, I will not. Yes, we have to tackle congestion in the city, but this plan to us is simply not the answer. I would like to thank you again for allowing me to address the committee today. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation. My name is Axel Carrion. I'm the Director of State Public Affairs at United Parcel Service, the world's largest package delivery company and leading provider of logistics services. UPS operates in 220 countries and territories, delivering 4.9 billion packages annually here in New York, 
We operate out of 11 facilities. We employ 54, 65 New Yorkers, 73% which are unionized workforce. We serve over 413,000 customers in all corners of New York City, including over 70,000 small businesses. As a logistics company, UPS is always seeking to improve efficiencies. Our delivery model utilizes one driver and one vehicle to make all package deliveries and pickups on a route, including critical overnight and next day air packages. By consolidating these pro products on one vehicle, we minimize the number of our trucks on the road and ensure consistent customer service. UPS has also instituted Orion for efficiently delivery route order and package uh, delivery route order. Company-wide, this has helped UPS reduce the distance driven by our drivers by over 100 million miles, miles and lowered our CO2 emissions by 100,000 metric tons. Programs such as UPS My Choice and Access Points have allowed UPS to further reduce our miles traveled by minimizing unnecessary redelivery attempts. UPS My Choice, implemented in 2011, allows customers to reschedule deliveries or reroute packages if they know they will not be able to accept them. UPS partners with local small businesses such as neighborhood corner stores to provide our customers with an alternative secure package delivery location. Currently, there are approximately 1,300 access points in New York City. Like many businesses operating in the city, worsening traffic congestion, especially in the Manhattan Central Business District, is a concern for UPS. When our drivers are stuck in traffic, it not only translates into lost productivity for UPS, it interrupts our customers' business operations. Our drivers are on Manhattan streets because they need to be, not because they choose to be. However, UPS has significant concerns about the Mayor's Congestion Action Plan and its implementation. In the Manhattan zone alone, the curbside restrictions imp impact 43 UPS routes. These drivers now must park further from their points of delivery, exacerbating congestion and competition for curb access on either side of the restricted zone. The impact on our drivers has been immediate. Since implementation in Midtown last week, drivers report having to park three avenues away from their delivery zones, requiring them to hand truck their packages long distance on crowded sidewalks. In order to maintain on-time service, UPS has begun adding helpers to these routes to assist the drivers. This is a short-term fix. In the long term, we anticipate having to add an additional 74 trucks to the affected routes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of New York City Council Committee on Transportation. Hello. Okay. Uh, my name is Nelson Eusebio. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the National Supermarket Association. The NSA is a trade association that represents the interests of independent supermarket owners in New York and other urban cities throughout the East Coast. In the five boroughs alone, we represent 400 stores that employ over 15,000 New Yorkers. We are here today to testify on the Mayor's Clear Curb and Clear Lane Congestion Plan. While the plan may, well, may be well intended, we cannot agree on congestion. Is a, we all agree congestion is a problem in New York City. Something must be done about it. We oppose the plan because it negatively impacts NSA businesses and their employees. This plan eliminates six hours of delivery time in any given business day, leaving only a very slim margin of time, 7 a.m. from when most supermarkets can receive deliveries. The morning hours of the clear car proposal are particularly troublesome. Supermarkets require delivery of perishable first thing in the morning to protect the quality of their goods. If customers see a decline in quality of goods, they will certainly take their business elsewhere. We hear a lot about nighttime deliveries, but this is simply not an option for our small business. To hire staff to take deliveries during the nighttime is costly and endeavor that will negatively impact our stores. In addition, our stores will require a separate area to refrigerate fresh products so it doesn't go bad, but our stores don't have the money or the space to make these accommodations. Furthermore, our employees don't, make, don't want to work at night, and many take jobs at our supermarkets specifically for this reason. In general, grocery stores' deliveries are large, sometimes exceeding over 1,000 cases. These deliveries have always occurred in the morning hours because security risks are minimized. Produce and other products are received fresh, and product is available in the store throughout the city that can be restocked accordingly. We have one member who is just finalizing the construction of a supermarket on Flatbush Avenue, and he is set to open any day now. 
The opening of this store is particularly important time for deliveries as the owner is stocking bare shelves. This ban will be tremendous burn during the most critical time of operation. Up until today, the ban was set to go into effect. The store owner has not been informed or received any correspondence regarding to this action. For these reasons, we urge the city to revisit the plan entirely and come up with a more meaningful plan that truly addresses congestion in the needs surrounding business through community and stakeholder uh, engagement. Uh, I have a little time left, and I just want to re remind the council that we are going to affect fruits, vegetables, milk, meat, breads that all need to be delivered on a timely basis. That is the quality of life of living in, of living in New York City, that you can get anything 24 hours a day freshly done. We're going to affect that. We're going to affect hundreds and thousands of jobs of people who work in supermarkets, who deliver, and who work in the warehouses. Plus, our employers are most of the time young mothers and parents who need the flexible times that we give them. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez, and, and thanks to you and your staff for, for holding this hearing, and thanks for Commissioner Trottenberg for uh, sticking around for a few minutes. My name is Alex Slacky. I'm here representing AAA Northeast, uh, which serves a membership of approximately 570,000 um, drivers in the five boroughs uh, and plenty more region-wide. And, and we come at this from a slightly different perspective as the rest of the panel, not representing ind industry, but representing personal automobile drivers. And, and we support a lot of the, the initiatives in the, the mayor's congestion plan. Uh, we do appreciate that the congestion plan is tackling issues citywide in the outer boroughs as well as Manhattan uh, with you know, the, the highway uh, initiatives and also the studies in Jamaica and Flushing, et cetera, et cetera. And we're certainly, you know, eager to evaluate uh, the results of, of how this is going. I, I know it's very early in the stages, but we're, we're certainly happy to, to continue monitoring that. We are very excited about um, the increased awareness of blocking the box violations. That is a violation that is the bane of every law-abiding motorist's commute. And the key to unblocking the box really is changing driver culture that treats it as routine. And, and that's something that we're hopeful that the additional markings and signs and continuous you know, emphasis on uh, education and, and, and of course uh, enforcement is an important part of that uh, will help to work uh, change that, that driver culture. Um, one thing that I did want to mention that hasn't been brought up in relation to tickets for things like double parking, blocking the box, no standing, when uh, those tickets are given out, most people are going to end up paying them, of course. Uh, but I took a look at the open cam uh, parking and camera violations database, looking at tickets from 2010 to 2016. And the most flagrant and habitual violators or, or non-payers are registered out of state. If you look at double parking for those seven years, the 10 cars with the most outstanding tickets, they were all registered in New Jersey they all had at least 50 unpaid tickets and cumulatively they, those 10 vehicle owners owe the city $189,000. Um, 216 vehicles had at least 10 unpaid tickets but only 34 of those were registered in New York. And, and you look at the statistics related to bus lane violations, they're very similar. So I think we would urge the city to convene a working group. I'm not even sure if this is the purview of DOT, but with NYPD, the Department of Finance, and any other relevant stakeholders to figure out how we can make sure that drivers who are getting penalized are, are paying the penalty, because we know uh, the drivers of, of the industry on this panel are, our members are, if they get a ticket, you know, and they're found guilty, they pay the penalty. We want to make sure that, that applies to everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to comment. Well, with that, I, I just like Thanks to the commissioner for staying, uh, at least to hear, uh, to hear from, the, from the first panel. Uh, and I, as we said before, we, I will be you know, following the commissioner, trying to put a meeting together. Uh, we led by DOT to bring EDC, SBS, and the council and, and mayor and, and the private sector to you not know, to look over, to talk about the plan. I, I, I think that the good thing is that the commission has been very clear. The administration is open to hear, to take the feedback. And as I say, I was there standing in the press conference with the mayor and the DOT when the, launch, when the initiative was launched. But I think in the last few months, I having the opportunity 
to go and visit some of those uh, major distributions, uh, headquarters that you have, and also meeting with you guys. I believe that it is time for us to come back together and, and see how, where can we find some compromise, where everyone do their part to encourage more uh, private sectors to get more delivery at night, at the same time that we address those particular hours, which is the morning, the afternoon, that now the major company, uh, private uh, delivery company, they will not be able to deliver. So thank you for staying around and we're looking to continue conversation with you and the rest of the panels. Thank you. Now I'm calling the second. Sorry. Rocco G. Lacer Toza from New York Heating Association. Heating. Bruce Krupo, Northeast Dairy Food Association. Jay Pelto, Food Industry, and Shane McMorrow from Mechanic Contractor Contractors. Arthur Krems, Kramer, Hans Point Market. If it's longer, as you summarize, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Council Member Rodriguez. My name is Bruce Krupke. I'm the Executive Vice President for the Northeast Dairy Foods Association. We're a trade association that represents dairy processors, manufacturers, and distributors throughout New York City and New York State. I'm pleased to be here today. It's good to see you again. Thank you for holding this oversight hearing. It's extremely important to our members. Our members are the milk companies that deliver the milk to the stores that you heard testify earlier. These milk companies procure milk from farms from far away. The cows milk all day long. We need to have that flow of milk going continuously. That milk flows to processors, and then it flows to distributors. Our distributors hire Teamster union members whose contracts don't allow us to start earlier than 3.30 in the morning, so we're already delivering as early as possible. The restrictions that are going to be put on our industry are immense. It's distorting our ability to distribute the products that's necessary. And as we sit here today, we've heard about diamonds, we've heard about petroleum, but most importantly, what I think you and your fellow council members should really focus on is the distribution of food. Food is essential. It should not be stopped, hindered for any purpose at any time on any day. Citizens of New York City deserve the free distribution of food. And delaying the food distribution, specifically perishable, nutritious dairy products of the companies that I represent, is overreaching by the mayor. We'd like to call on you and the city council to take control of this situation, to introduce a bill to put a stop to it, to exempt food from these restrictions. And I believe that it's the right of every citizen of New York City to not have food delayed at any time for any purpose. We understand that there's congestion. Our industry has done everything that we can to reduce the number of deliveries. We implement logistical and technical uh, information all the time to, to route our trucks as profitably as possible. And we think it is extremely important that the council take this initiative over and truly face what's happening. We'd like to see um, the ability for these food trucks and our, our delivery vehicles to be able to operate freely at all times. I've provided a paper and it outlines all of our concerns which we've suggested in the past and also some compromises that we think 
could be implemented. And I hope that you'll agree that food should be given the utmost priority when taking a look at some compromises for what the mayor is trying to do. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing us to uh, testify today. Uh, my name is Rocco Lasertosa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the New York Oil Heating Association. Uh, NIOA, founded in 1939, is one of the country's largest heating oil trade associations, representing 150 members, including terminals, retailers, and associated businesses operating in the five boroughs. NIOA has enjoyed an excellent working relationship with New York City over many years. We've supported many of the city's key environmental policies, including the elim elimination of number six oil, the phase out of number four oil, and the increase in biodiesel blends that have made New York City the cleanest heating oil uh, market in the country. Uh, while uh, we appreciate DOT's flexibility, I do think that a, uh, an exemption is warranted in our case. NIOA members deliver an essential commodity, heating oil and provide emergency heating service to thousands of customers throughout the metropolitan area every day of the year in good weather and bad. The mayor's congestion plan is of great concern to our members. It would place a major logistical burden on hardworking heat oil businesses, many of them mom and pop operators, along with their employees, as well as hinder important emergency deliveries throughout that New Yorkers rely on to provide heat. Heating oil delivery and especially equipment repair is an emergency service. Emergency requests to fix equipment or deliver oil come in at all times of the day and night. This is why, for example, heating oil vehicles are permitted to have limited use of New York City parkways during snow emergencies. Homeowners, building owners, and city agencies, including DCAS, Health and Hospitals, NYPD, and NYCHA, among others, rely on timely heating oil service. This is why the industry requests an exemption to the clear curbs and clear lanes policies. 203 heating oil companies are registered within the five boroughs and make deliveries or service calls within the city. Further, Westchester and Long Island-based companies have contracts with city-based clients as well. Some of our larger member companies have more than 200 accounts in Midtown alone. One particular company has 20 accounts in the Clear Lanes area. Deliveries restricted to certain times of the day will force companies to completely change the way they do business, inconvenience customers, delay an essential delivery in an emergency situation, in many cases, large institutions that NIOA members deliver to have fixed times for deliveries so they can have personnel on hand to receive the delivery. If a customer runs out of oil, needs an emergency delivery, or requires an uh, equipment service call, the company will need to decide if they make a delivery as soon as possible and in turn face the possibility of a penalty or a fine. Furthermore, having to delay a service request response could cause a building owner to be fined for failure to provide heat and cause freeze-ups of pipes and other equipment which can be costly to repair. Just this past winter, the freezing weather and historically low temperatures in January saw utilities triggering their interruptible contracts, meaning that they switch from natural gas to heating oil when gas pressures run low and they cannot meet the demands of their customers. This switching based added approximately one million heating oil gallons per day above normal demand. The heating oil industry stepped up to meet that demand, deploying additional delivery trucks in order to keep buildings and homes warm across the city. We urge the city to exempt heating oil businesses from the congestion plan. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez. Uh, my name is Shane McMahon. I'm the Assistant Vice President of the Mechanical Contractors Association. And uh, the MCA is an organization representing over 300 firms that employ steam fitters, local Union 638. We represent mechanical and licensed fire sprinkler contractors that are responsible for the installation, inspection, testing, and maintenance of heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, and fire suppression systems in all building types throughout New York City and Long Island. Our contractors install and maintain much of the complex network of piping that runs the tens of thousands of high density residential commercial, industrial, and industrial buildings, including hospitals, universities, power plants, and water treatment facilities across this region. While the mayor's goal of reducing congestion is laudable, the reality is that our members often cannot comply with these rules because they are providing essential and at, at times emergency services to customers. MCA contractors service the necessary heating, cooling, and fire suppression piping and equipment in all buildings. From helping properly maintain food, food services through refrigeration in supermarkets to ensuring HVAC and fire sprinkler systems are functioning in hospitals, 
schools, data centers, and all other buildings throughout the city. Though plenty of maintenance can be scheduled, emergencies often arise at all times of day, and contractors must respond as soon as possible as these situations cannot wait. Most contractors in this industry are small and medium-sized businesses operating on thin margins, and they already experience significant costs of doing business. Putting aside the cost of labor, providing these services to New Yorkers comes with a steep price, including but not limited to covering the cost of a service van with the necessary tools and equipment, ever-increasing insurance premiums, gas, parking, and the tolls to already enter New York City from many nearby locations. As mentioned, these services are not optional and are often time sensitive. Grocery stores cannot afford to wait three hours to cool their food. Data centers and labs cannot wait for the morning rush hour to pass before calling to have their cooling system fixed. And schools cannot hold off until the end of the day to call and have a heat pump serviced. Similarly, when a fire suppression system is calling for servicing, that necessary work can rarely wait. Finally, many contractors sign multi-year service agreements that prevent them from easily addressing these pricing changes or changes to operations in their businesses. Contractors will be tasked with finding a way to provide the same quality and timeliness of service while also abiding by these regulation changes. Asking a small business on a small margin to pick up what amounts to a significant cost increase without the ability to renegotiate a contract is a tough way for them to operate. While it is necessary to combat congestion, the Mechanical Contractors Association of New York does not support the mayor's congestion plan as it unfairly targets the small business community that we represent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for your time and for hearing the concerns of our industry. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Arthur Jerry Kremer, representing Hunts Point Market and the Plumbing Foundation. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure it's no surprise to you as a person who is very much involved with the uh, functions of New York City, <clears throat> the necessity of places like Hunts Point Market with 3,000 employees being able to deliver the meats that come in from all over this country and the various provisions in the early morning hours and again in the later days. The vast majority of the restaurants, the bodegas, the various types of businesses that rely on what Hunts Point delivers, these are industries which cannot afford the luxury of being told you can deliver them at night. The vast majority of these restaurants don't have storage space, so they require deliveries twice a day. So the fact of the matter is, is that we, like the other people at this table, are asking you to look at what carve-outs are necessary and what carve-outs are not. Let's talk about the Plumbing Foundation. When there's a major leak in a building involving your constituents or people who, you, who live in any of the five boroughs, uh, when you get to the time of going to fix those leaks, uh, going to try to uh, avoid emergencies, there's just no way to say to them, you know, park 15 blocks away. And while I have a lot of time left, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll get to see that my statement is delivered to the other members of the committee who are here. But as a former state legislator, I'd like to give you a piece of advice. I spent 23 years in Albany, and I've listened to all these plans and all these, uh, how New York City is going to be helped. I think the city council has to play a bigger role, if you will, on the input on congestion pricing. I don't think legislators from Plattsburgh and Oneonta and Kinderhook and Buffalo should decide what kind of congestion pricing plan New York City needs. So my suggestion is, is that the council has to be more proactive, if you will, in, in laying out what congestion pricing should be. Uh, I will add, parenthetically, that uh, we did a survey among our 48 co-op members in Hunts Point about the current Clear Lanes project, and no one had ever received any information or advice about it. So once again, it goes to the whole issue of how, how much the city is doing, if you will, to provide information for the people who are affected by it. But you've got a very weighty burden, but I'm suggesting to you that you and the council and you as a chair play a major role in crafting a plan that we can live with. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the, the Clear Curbs Initiative. My name is Jay Peltz, and I'm the general counsel and senior vice president of government relations for the Food Industry Alliance of New York. FIA is a nonprofit trade association that advocates on behalf of grocery, drug, and convenience stores throughout New York. Under the initiative, curbside parking and loading will be barred during peak weekday hours. This will be highly disruptive to traditional neighborhood grocers. The entire supply chain is built around morning deliveries. Perishables must be delivered fresh first thing in the morning or sales will be lost as freshness diminishes. Limited storage space in city stores means that deliveries must occur frequently, sometimes daily. 
By eliminating six hours of delivery time each day, daily deliveries will become impossible. In addition, grocery deliveries are immense, involving full trailer loads of product, sometimes exceeding 1,000 cases. Historically, these deliveries have been done in the morning. This is because security risks are minimized in the morning. Product can be received early in the day and then packed out throughout the day, thus facilitating faster replenishment and minimizing out of stocks of staple food and medicines. And employees generally do not want to work outside at night, particularly in the cold. Accordingly, late night or overnight deliveries of full trailers of groceries are not a viable option. Diverting perishable and grocery deliveries from the 7 to 10 a.m. window is highly problematic in other ways. Often, apartment building and collective bargaining agreement restrictions prohibit deliveries before 7 a.m. In addition, shifting deliveries to the narrow six-hour period allowed after 10 a.m. would require major revisions to employees' work schedules, which might be prohibited under collective bargaining agreements and, if allowed, would be disruptive to employees' personal lives. Accordingly, delivery disruptions caused by broad implementation of the restrictions will result in a sharp increase in out-of-stocks, including staple food items such as baby formula and milk, as well as medication, thus depriving customers of essential products and causing retailers to lose sales. An increase in labor costs due to the need to schedule labor based on the delivery restrictions rather than the most efficient way to deliver and receive product, and an increase in cost of goods, thus reducing already razor-thin grocery store margins as suppliers pass through to retailers the costs they incur because of the planned restrictions. In light of our, for the reasons cited in our testimony, we respectfully request that the Clear Curbs Initiative be suspended while private and government stakeholders collaborate on revisions to the restrictions. Our goal is to establish the right balance between industry needs and quality of life and environmental concerns. Specifically, we would like to discuss designated delivery windows for grocery, perishable, and drug products during weekdays between 7 and 10 a.m. Thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we, again, we will, yes, invite all of you to the meeting that you heard. I've been suggesting to the commissioner. My suggestion is not from the elected official perspective, but from the organizing perspective. You also need to organize your numbers. Because my reaction when I saw here how the representative of the interest here was more probably there's conversation going on and they already working the compromise. Because if I would be the organizer representing the industry, I will pack this place with those who will be affected. I care about this issue. I, I think it is important. I think that there's an opportunity to get a compromise. But from the organizing perspective, my message is like, this is a hearing that should be like the whole place back here from those who will be affected on the delivery and the on those receiving the delivery too. So I'm committed to continue working with you, but my suggestion is put the numbers together too. Numbers when it comes to you know, the faces of those individuals, you know, the, who will be affected. I think that, you know, we need to come out with a solution. And I, what I heard from those of you that I had the opportunity to meet is that you are not saying this is a black and white. You are saying, yes, we can discuss, we can have conversation, but the way of how this plan was presented did not give the opportunity to us to be part of this. So we will continue again. We will call you to the meeting, and, and I appreciate that you're here, but my suggestion, again, is not from the council perspective, but from the my organizing experience about this place should be full. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next panel is Barry Penicula, PM Blank, Jack Davis, and Eric McClure. This is the last one. If by any chance there was anyone that I didn't call, this is the last moment for you to let the sergeants and take a cheer and use your three minutes. You continue. 
Thank you. My name is Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. On behalf of my colleagues, thanks for the opportunity to testify today regarding the critical issue of the traffic congestion choking New York City streets. Today's oversight hearing is critical in light of the failure of the governor and state legislature to take meaningful, meaningful action on congestion in the budget process just concluded. While the surcharge on ride hailing vehicles and taxis will generate a fair amount of revenue, such a limited first stab at dealing with congestion will have minimal effect on actually solving the problem. Albany is not alone in deserving criticism, however. Mayor de Blasio, who for months has repeated without foundation that a congestion charge is somehow regressive, has done much to provide opponents of a comprehensive congestion reduction effort with political cover. While his millionaire's tax isn't a bad idea for helping to fund and fix the MTA, it does nothing to address the twin crisis of crippling traffic. Additionally, while the congestion action plan the mayor announced in October includes some good and sensible ideas, it amounts to tinkering around the edges. Cracking down on blocking the box and keeping curbs and travel lanes clear during, during peak hours are useful, useful steps, but the program's reliance on human enforcement guarantees that it will have limited effect. What we really need is bold action on a large scale and with an unwavering commitment to fixing the problem. Here are a half dozen steps the council can take to help break gridlock's hold on New York City. First, we urge the council to pass a home rule message in support of the Fix NYC panel's congestion pricing recommendations. Passing a home rule message now will send a strong signal to Albany that it must act before the end of the current term to at least fund the infrastructure necessary to create a cordoned tolling zone. In addition, this committee heard last June from experts who contend that the city can implement congestion pricing on its own. If Albany is unwilling to act to address congestion, we urge the council to take the initiative and pass legislation authorizing congestion pricing. Secondly, the city should act to significantly reduce the number of parking placards at issues. The more than 100,000 placards in circulation are a major contributor to congestion, exacerbated by an unknown number of fake placards and other paraphernalia that, that somehow earn abusers a free pass. Cutting the number of placards coupled with real enforcement could keep tens of thousands of cars out of Manhattan. Thirdly, the city should take a very hard look at reforming parking policies. In too many places, we charge too little for parking, which encourages more driving. The Department of Transportation should expand the Park Smart program, which increases meter rates when demand is highest, and should follow through on its promise for a more comprehensive management plan for the metered parking environment, which it indicated was coming more than two years ago. Fourth, the city should follow up immediately on a citywide transit plan for, for which it held public workshops early last year by prioritizing bus service on city streets. Far too many buses move far too slowly, which is a key factor in the large drop in bus ridership we've seen over the past few years. DOT released its New York City Mobility Report a year and a half ago and should now be introducing fixes to speed up buses like implementing signal priority, building more bus only and queue jump lanes, and, uh, and more boarding islands. Fifth, in the absence of any meaningful action on congestion pricing, the city should consider implementing rush hour HOV restrictions on the free, free East River bridges. And lastly, the, shitty, the city should strongly require, strongly consider requiring off-hour deliveries in the city's most congested areas, implement more dedicated loading zones, and encourage the use of smaller, more nimble vehicles for the last mile of delivery trips. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Barry Panacola, and I serve as the Metro Region Vice Chairman of the Trucking Association of New York. I'd like to thank Chairman Rodriguez and all of the members of the committee for the invitation to testify before you today. As an industry, we have a vested interest in finding ways to alleviate congestion in New York City. A recent study conducted by the American Transportation Research Institute calculates annual congestion costs to the trucking industry to be over $63 billion. A ranking of counties across the nation with highest congestion costs per mile resulted in New York, Bronx, Queens, and Kings counties topping the list. Congestion issues didn't occur overnight, and they can't be solved overnight. Additionally, there is no single solution. It will take a variety of programs and initiatives that can meet unique needs of both the trucking industry and their customers to address congestion. While the May's congestion action plan may be well intended, it completely misses the mark. Truck travel is not discretionary. The truck driver doesn't make a decision when to make a delivery. Their customer does. Given the choice, truck drivers would prefer to make deliveries during off-peak hours when traffic is lighter. Expansion of the off-peak delivery program is an area we believe immediate focus would be beneficial. Our association has been a partner in this program since it was first piloted in 2009. Incentivizing receivers to accept off-hour deliveries is key to the success of the program. While there, were, there are many benefits of the off-peak delivery program, there are receivers that have specific daytime delivery needs that prevent them from shifting to off-peak deliveries. 
Solutions on how to improve efficiencies of those deliveries must be included in any initiative related to easing congestion. In Manhattan alone, there are nearly 350,000 deliveries on a daily basis. Ensuring there are adequate parking or delivery zones can assist in alleviating uh, congestion, but providing locations for drivers to get out of the flow of traffic and, remove, and reduce the amount of time that drivers have to circle a location. Providing locations to allow consolidation of deliveries is another area we feel warrants research. Location, locations such as restaurants, grocery stores often, often take multiple deliveries a day. When feasible, the ability to consolidate those deliveries into a signal delivery can reduce the number of truck trips into the city, ease demand on parking, and result in lower emissions. These options are just a fraction of many congestion initiatives that have successfully implemented by other cities around the nation and the globe. The biggest flaw with the May's congestion plan is the lack, of, the lack of stakeholder engagement. Trying to find a solution without fully understanding why the problem exists is a recipe for failure. Implementing a program focused on enforcement against vehicles in restricted zones rather than determining why they're in those zones is short-sighted. Initial feedback from the field this week from one company is that trucks are being ticketed and their hotel customer is retiring them to requiring them to deliver in the morning due to internal controls for product receipt and previous off-hour delivery issues with overnight hotel staff. In light of, we have been working with the New York City DOT to develop the Smart Truck Management Plan, which is due out this summer. In light of this work, implementation of the May's Congestion Plan was premature and ill-timed. We look forward to working with the City Council and the City of New York uh, on addressing this issue. I'd like to thank you again for this time today. Good afternoon. My name is Liam Blank, Advocacy Manager of Tri-State Transportation Campaign, speaking on behalf of Tri-State, our Allies Riders Alliance, and NY Perg's Strap Hangers Campaign. I'm here today because New York City's public transit policies aren't working, and they haven't been working for a while. Ridership on MTA buses has fallen 21% over the last eight eight years. The subway system is at capacity and service continues to deteriorate. As a result, riders are abandoning mass transit and many are opting to use four hire vehicles. The end result, Manha Manhattan streets already clogged with traffic are seeing even more cars take to the road. Without a new significant revenue stream that fixes our subways and buses while charging a fair price for congestion and pollution, we're forced to settle for more temporary solutions to a complex multifaceted problem, equivalent to treating a broken bone with a Band-Aid. The measures proposed by Mayor de Blasio last year, like restricting parking and delivery times for delivery vehicles, as well as the Block the Box initiative, do very little to address our city's growing congestion problem. Further, there are no serious improvements to bus service included as part of the Mayor's congestion plan, and his previously announced select bus service improvements do not go far enough. Taking this issue seriously, we need each of you to support or continue to support the implementation of full congestion pricing as outlined by the Fix NYC panel. This is the only solution that works, and we look forward to working with you in the coming months as we continue to advance this transit funding proposal. In the meantime, there are steps we can take that will have an immediate positive impact on buses. Everyone has a role to play. The MTA should conduct more bus network redesigns, improve dispatching and adherence to schedules, and commit to system-wide all-door boarding on local buses. Further, the DOT and City Council should expand bus lanes to at least 10 additional priority routes and enforce the law by ticketing unauthorized vehicles that abuse bus lanes. We are pleased with Council Member Levine's transit signal priority legislation requiring DOT to install TSP on 10 routes each year. Your support has been instrumental in calling attention to deteriorating bus service. Now to get started on solving it, we encourage the city to expand the DOT's budget for these transit initiatives in particular. We appreciate your support and thank you for considering our recommendations. Chairman Rodriguez, thank you for convening this hearing and for the chance to testify. My name is Jack Davies. I'm the campaign manager at Transportation Alternatives. Two weeks ago, Governor Cuomo and legislative leaders in Albany struck a deal on this year's state budget. While the bill includes certain important transit policies, the final budget does not offer a credible plan nor provide a sufficient revenue stream to fix the subways and gridlock and make our streets safer. 
In the absence of meaningful leadership from Albany, the crisis in our subways and on our streets will continue. New Yorkers will still demand action, and this leadership vacuum creates a unique opportunity for city leaders to implement impactful policies that will both help alleviate congestion in the short term and lay the foundation for a successful future congestion pricing campaign. The city can start by addressing urgent needs in transit deserts across the city. The city must use the tools at its disposal to enhance bus service and expedite bicycle lane infrastructure in these transit deserts before congestion pricing is implemented. It will make city transit infrastructure and future tolling plans more equitable while building the political capital necessary to work a congestion pricing plan through the legislature. As part of addressing these transit deserts, the city should implement limited high occupancy vehicle restrictions on the East River bridges. After the September 11th attacks, the Giuliani administration banned single occupancy vehicles from crossing bridges and tunnels into Manhattan south of 63rd Street between 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. This resulted in a 23% decrease in traffic during the morning peak. Implementing rush hour HOV restrictions would significantly limit congestion by reducing the amount of cars coming into Manhattan in lower Manhattan during rush hour, the looming L train shut down and the subsequent strain in the transportation network offers an opportunity to test this policy more widely. The city should also study the feasibility of implementing a congestion pricing trial in a small specific area of the city by testing congestion pricing, regularly evaluating outcomes and supplying them to the media in terms of the reductions of traffic levels, the minutes of increased free flow time and decreased congestion time the amount of fuel saved for commuting trips and the amount of reduced pollutions and improved public transport service levels can offer hard evidence that congestion pricing will meaningfully improve the commutes and day-to-day -day lives of millions of New Yorkers. Additionally, because traffic congestion is an ongoing economic health and safety crisis, the city must begin to equitably tackle street congestion using the most powerful tool they have at their disposal, legal authority over the more than 6,000 miles of road across the city. By reforming the city's outdated on-street parking policies, the city can meaningfully reduce congestion without state oversight. Finally, if the city council is genuine in its support for congestion pricing and the need to make our streets safer, more sustainable, and more equitable for all, then you must pass a home rule message of support for congestion pricing this year, showing legislators in Albany that the city is united in its call for reform. Our transit system is on life support. New Yorkers continue to suffer daily from our deteriorating and underfunded transit infrastructure and congested roads cost the region $20 billion each year in lost economic productivity and job creation. New Yorkers simply cannot afford to wait to see action on a serious plan to fix our transit system and curb the region's traffic. We deserve better than broken subways, unsafe streets, and crippling gridlock, and it's time for our representatives, all of them, to deliver. With that, we're coming to the end. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, invite everyone to continue sending your ideas and suggestions on this uh, around the, the traffic congestion through the mayor's congestion action plan and other strategies. As you heard, we will be inviting to a meeting to the industries and also the advocate. Uh, together with DOT, SBS, uh, EDC, and the council. And I would say that we heard uh, uh, some ideas and suggestions about how to bring deliveries at night, require better plan or scheduling, and also incentives uh, to, for those who do the deliveries and the recipients of those deliveries. So everyone is committed to make our streets safer in our city. We know that congestion is real. So with that, we come to the end. And I would like to thank the council staff, Mala, Maserek Dine, uh, Jonathan Maserano, Emily Rooney, Shima Obicheri, Joan Basili, and my deputy chief of staff, Stephanie Miliano, my chief of staff, Jose Luis. With that, this hearing is adjourned.